G'day guys, it's Ben here. Welcome to another episode of the Pumped on Property Show. Now today I know I say this too often, but I'm seriously, seriously pumped on property. I actually just learned so much, probably more than I've learned about finance and broking and how to borrow money and how to get great credit scores and how to leverage money than I've learned from any other broker that I've ever spoken to. In today's episode, I sit down with Clay, super experienced investor who is one of the top brokers at Aussie Homes. Um, we talk about his experiences at the start of the podcast over the six or seven properties he's picked up in the last 20 plus years. We talk about his experiences in the Air Force before coming a broker. We have a laugh about the good properties and the not so good ones that he's bought. Um, absolute cracking conversation. And then we go super, super, super deep into all of the questions that I've always wanted to ask or wanted to explain on camera, but because I'm not licensed to do so, I couldn't. Um, so we talk about things like credit scores, borrowing money, first tier lenders, second tier lenders, um, offset accounts, we talk about equity, we talk about how to borrow money for multiple properties, guarantors, all the fun stuff. It definitely is a longer conversation than normal, but it is packed with absolute gold. Um, Clay's definitely, after today, hopefully gonna come back and do more. Um, really, really appreciate the conversation. Let's get stuck into it. Awesome, mate. Well, welcome to the show today. So happy Thank to you. have you on board. I know we've been talking about this for a little while. Um, it's outside of your wheelhouse like it is for everyone. So thank you so much for getting outside the box. Um, just in terms of talking about what we're going to talk about today, I just wanted everyone to know that they're like dead set up for some of like the funniest stories I've ever heard in property um, on average. So, you know, before we talk about where you are now and where you're going in the future, which is obviously an incredibly different position than where you started, um, let's take it back to where it all began. And, you know, let's talk about why you got into property and what those first few properties looked like. So, Ben, I, first off, I'd done a bit of research before we um, came today. Do you know how many YouTube videos you've done? I don't know. 756. 756, wow. Do you know how many I've done? Like, because I thought we'd have a bit of a competition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you know how many YouTube videos I've done, like, lately? How many? This is my first one. This is <laughs> yeah, number my, one. This is number one. So well you, got it, you got it pretty easy on me. Did but, you um, know what? I deleted my first 300 videos as well. Wow. And so you're over a thousand. Yeah, and I, and I did about... 400 with Ryan from On Property too. So this would actually oh, be a wow. video for me, like 1,400. And I'm Man. still stuck at them. So no, like, that's so good. You yeah. must be a um, bit of pressure on me then, like you're um, seasoned, <laughs> no. seasoned podcaster. <laughs> I'm a vet. Yeah, and I'm very much <laughs> as green as you can be, but yeah, no, cool. At least you got the caramel voice, bro. Man, I got the 14 year old oh, baby's voice. I've got the Kiwi accent. <laughs> how, how bad is it? But you gotta understand growing up, Kiwis are not good at conversation. Like the average conversation is, how was your weekend? You yeah, good. <laughs> Did you do anything? Good, bro. Nah. You know, that, that, is the average, that is the average Kiwi conversation. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to work on that and try to, you know, get Look, a man, I'm going to be asking some funny stuff today. Just, you know, I think the, the thing is with everyone with all these, and um, this is actually recording, by the way, so this yeah. will be funny when we've got this up. <laughs> okay. But, like, it's just rolling with it, and it's just yeah. like there's no pressure – I, I have a laugh with it all. I, I create this content for me. I got you on here and future potties because you are an absolute specialist in the lending space at the moment. One of the top performing, if not the top performers. I don't want to speak out of school, but what, yeah. what are you? How do we even uh, say that? With so Aussie is a pretty big company, a few brokers. And I was, lucky, I was lucky enough last year, I got top mobile broker. Queensland and National. So, so number long. one mobile broker in Australia. For Aussie. For Aussie homes. It's a bit like when you get those wines that have won an award for their own period. <laughs> but you know, you've got to take your wins. You've got to take your wins where you can. So, But Aussie's cool. got some seriously good operators. And yeah, for sure. you know, I love how you say Lark. Um, but then before this, when we were talking a moment ago, you just said the last two days you've been up at 7 a.m. and working till 9 p.m. Yeah. But uh, it feels like a fair bit of hard work in that luck as well, the same as me and every other person listening to this kicking ass as well. For sure. Like when you start out, there's been times when my wife is like, hey, you know, I say, hey, when are you running in the morning? I'm going to have to run at six. Cool, I'll try to be finished by five. So I go into the office, I work till 5 a.m., come back, 
grab the boys and Michelle goes for a run, you know, because I think when anyone's starting something, you've got to graft at the start, you know. I come yeah. from an aircraft engineering background, so there's a lot for me to learn, you know. Yeah, there's, yeah. and you know, like, you don't get it all at once. And that's a beautiful thing about second careers, third careers for both of us. You know, that's a good place to start, actually, like, pre-becoming, like, Aussie's dude. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, <laughs> pressure's on now. <laughs> what were you... What were you doing before you started buying property? Because obviously you need an income. Yeah. Um, so did you go straight out of school into the Air Force in New Zealand or were you doing okay. something first? There's a pretty cool story. So I, um, I grew up in the most boring town in New Zealand and we won that title twice, which is big title takes us in boring towns in New Zealand. So for Levin to win most boring town two years in a row is um, saying something. So I grew up there. I studied um, at school. I loved economics, maths, accounting. I was probably on track to go into something like finance, but I remember sitting on the couch, I had come up, joined the Air Force. And I was like, wow, I could get out of Levin. So I joined the Air Force and um, next to know, you know, I'd end up doing 12 and a half years in there. And wow. all on just, I'm pretty sure a TV ad, where I'm just sitting there going, <laughs> Levin or Air Force? And it was a good chance to get me out, but- um, They should do an Aussie TV ad for the breaking side of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe so those people can sit there and like, oh, I can also get, there are other options, I don't have to join the forces. But it was pretty cool, like I, um, I worked in 20 countries, done a couple of six month yeah. deployments, had a real good time. Wow. I met my wife, in fact one time, I was heading away for six months to Asia, in the Pacific on the back of a ship, fixing wow. the helicopter, and the, um, I proposed to my wife the day before I sailed. Wow. Just and like, i got to lock this in. Got to lock it in. Be gone well, I get back. You could say, I've got to lock it in. Probably <laughs> more pressure from Michelle saying, you better lock this in. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I locked that in. And then when I came back, I knew I, I, I was a good engineer, but I, I didn't have passion in it. I love property. Yeah. Mm. And then I um, said to her, hey, look, I really want to get into property and do something, finance, something like that, get out of the engineering. She said, hey, Clay, why have you been away? I bought a bike and I'm getting really good at triathlons. I want to turn pro. So then we moved to Malulaba. I took two years leave from the Air Force because Michelle had a dream. She wanted to be a professional triathlete. Okay. We moved to Malulaba. She entered Ironman W Australia, Ironman WA Australia, and she won her first ever Ironman as a pro. Wow, incredible! So it was probably one of the yeah, coolest things I've had. I remember she had a tri suit that said um, from TYR, and I remember someone saying, "Oh, you sponsored by TYR?" She's like, "No, no, I bought this." Like last week, like as like the this is, one, you this know. is like yeah, I, I brought this from the shop. Like, you know, <laughs> and who do you get your bike from? Yeah, pay from this is my bike. You know, like yeah, yeah. So that was pretty cool. And we An spent an expensive the way to be a professional athlete. But you got to do that. You got to graft at the start, and then yeah. so then she set up a website. We done. Um, we spend the next five years race doing racing with her. Wow. So she raced in South Africa, Mexico, Germany, Austria. We lived in LA, done New York, had a good time. Wow. That's pretty cool. See, this is the first time I'm hearing this stuff. Like I said, there's a, this is why I love sitting down and just geeking out on, on what's been going on. Yep. Yeah, she won Ironman Australia twice and, you know, I got two. The, and then looking back, it seems like a lifetime ago. I don't know if you have times in your life where like I think of Air Force is like two lifetimes ago. Yeah. That was probably a lifetime ago. And then after she'd done all that, I said, hey, look, now can I get into do something different? I was working for McDermott's fixing helicopters, the water bombers, the life on choppers. She said, hey, I wouldn't mind some kids. So then um, then we've got two little boys now. And when my second boy was born, I said, hey, how about now? She said, yes, okay. So I rang up Aussie and asked if I could become a broker. Wow. So I... Um, because I remember the very first conversation that we ever had when you were still working on the helicopters and you were like, I want to be yeah. in this space. Like you knew for a while, uh, like I knew for a while too. Like I went for hundreds of interviews to try and get into the property space. And everyone's like, you're too young or your skills don't correspond or they're like, it's such a bumpy industry with the booms and the bus and the sentiment. You know, people that I had that were mentors were like, I, w I just don't want that for you to have to go through it. I'm like, but I just love helping people and I love yeah. property. And I'm like, this is what I want to do. And it took me about five years to make that jump. And I've every single day of it, I've enjoyed, you know, there's parts of it like, painful clients yep. me being anxious sometimes working you know seven till nine in the first three years of business feels like a pleasure i wish i did that yeah. <laughs> it's like oh, it's... big days um myself in the old days but i'm just like 
I enjoy the work. It doesn't feel like work to me because I, I love investing. I was doing it for free. Now I just get to get paid to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and I guess the best thing about um, being a broker is I feel I'm just genuinely helping people. So I don't cost anyone anything. Yeah, you're free. The bank pay me, you know, if we choose to go to Westpac or CBA or NAB, the bank pay me for, you know, hey, thanks for sending Ben through to us. It makes my job really genuine. Like I, if you come to me, hey, can I want to buy a home? Cool, what do you want to do? I, there's no bias. I just want to be helpful and, yeah, I just find the genuineness of, um, yeah, just trying to help people get into a good place, you know? No, I love that, man. And every person that we've ever introduced you to as a business has just had the exact same feedback. Like you took the time to educate them. Um, at your own detriment sometimes <laughs> <Obviously, laughs> no, not but, being able to put the boys to bed some nights but it's just like you know as you said grafting uh, is that a New Zealand thing is grafting is that not an Aussie term I don't know oh, okay. I, I hear grafting it like, no definitely a Kiwi term yeah we'll it's find just it. like you just gotta you know when you're all in you're all in and this is the stage of life to go for it as well and on the flip side like I I like the fact being that you know when we spoke about hey I'd like to you know hey can I you know, send some people your way. I like that was also like a, um, just a genuineness there where there's no, you know, I, I don't chat, I'm not, there's no money transaction, just like, hey Ben, can you genuinely help this person? And then you send it to me and say, clearly help this person. I find that that's so genuine and just so, um, yeah, it's awesome. No, I love it, man. So you're in the Air Force when you bought your first property still? Yep. Okay. So let's get, let's get on this okay. bandwagon because oh. it's about to kick off. Oh, so I've, how old are you at this point, roughly? So I just came out of recruit course. I was 19. Just been yelled at for 12 weeks. Um, yeah, character loved, building stuff. Loved it or hated it? Hated it at the time, but loved it looking back. You know, one of those things that's really hard, but you make some really good mates there, you know, like there's still friends now that I could just ring and they just... Yeah. You went through that together. Yeah, yeah. We got yelled at by a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a bit like the movies, but um, so I get out of there. My mum says, hey, you should buy a property. So thought okay i found a block of land for 18 grand yeah and bulls which is which, um, uh, which island north new island real it's on the main so new zealand has a road that runs from straight to top to the bottom called state highway one yeah bulls is a little town in state highway one i found land for 18 grand jackpot like cheapest block in new zealand almost I'm taking a route 66 in america yep. or something like yeah. just something. <laughs> maybe not as cool but yeah, <laughs> yeah. but similar route one yeah state highway one and then so I bought this land. I went to the bank. They said, hey, look, you don't even need a home loan. You can just buy it with a personal loan. Because it's such a small Because it's only 18 grand. <laughs> Why muck around with a home loan? You can just buy it. And so I bought the block of land. We'll only charge you three times more interest on the Yeah, land. but I was just so <laughs> stoked I found a block of land. <laughs> Not like you got to, mate, I had a win. So I owned that for like maybe two years. And then a lady rang me. She was in the Air Force. She owned the house next door. Hey, Clay, would you sell me your land? I was like, oh, I'd sort of forgotten about it. But what are you offering you? You know, I'll bite off you for 65. And I was like, cha -ching, cha -ching. so you're thinking like, oh, you know, I have a think about it because I want to play the cool card. But really, I'm like, woo -hoo. I'm 21. Like, <laughs> I've just made 40,000 yeah, bucks. Yeah, 40,000 bucks. <laughs> you know, like I haven't, I haven't saved the dollar in the whole, that whole time. And get, correct me if I'm wrong, but at that time, even with investment properties, it was capital gains free in NZ. They've only just. I mean, yeah, it was. It was at that stage. Yeah. So, so I just, I just banked, the whole, just banked the whole lot. The and I was so happy. But it was, I was, it was dangerous there because I was, I was dangerously confident in my investing ability. It's like but, everything I took stands to gold. <laughs> but dangerously had a low amount of education on it. Like, you know, as far as I was concerned, I was one of the best investors around. Like, <laughs> I just tripled my money in two years. And um, how easy is property investing? So you, is the, my strategy was just buy a property in two years, just sell it for triple. And if I just do that forever, <laughs> I'm going to be like, how good Warren is this? Buffett is like, <laughs> how good is not getting returns. Let's talk about 200% returns, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> so then I had, I had this money. I've moved to Auckland to work on um, some planes up there with the Air Force. And they said, I met this guy and he was a property investor. And he said, hey, Clay, you know, he was actually a buyer's agent or thing. And he said, hey, look, why don't you buy in Auckland for 500 grand, 20K from the north of the city on like Tiaratu Peninsula, so the beach, like the water. It's sort of, yeah, inland, inland, but it's got a big um, the Auckland Harbour. Okay. So it's a nice spot. You can see the city. 500 grand for a property there. I was thinking, mate, <laughs> it's Clay Brimmer. Like, I just thought, like, how about you? How about Do you, you know what I've you, done? You should, <laughs> mate, grab a seat. I'll tell you. <laughs> like, cool, no, but I was young, you know, and I, 
I said, Dave, <laughs> I felt like when he was talking to me, I was thinking, mate, this, this guy just doesn't know about balls. So I, so I took, I said, mate, thanks for your <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your info. the place where he bought the lead, mate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I said, yeah. So I said, mate, thanks for your info. Appreciate it. <laughs> it sounds great. Good luck. So I took my, took my money and I found a house in Bulls. Yeah, the same place that was like my... I'm going back to the going back. <laughs> <laughs> So I bought a house for 110 grand, yeah. Oh, on man. the same highway, on the it, same street? But this house is actually on the highway. Like, if you drive from Auckland to Wellington, <laughs> you have to drive through this, my, past my house. That includes trucks, location, semi-trailers. Location, location, yeah, and on it, the highway. <laughs> and it, yeah, how good. Like, <laughs> what more can you want? Like, you are right on the highway. And it's right where the um, 100K goes to 50 so like you get the engine brake and you get everyone tearing there's off no, out of there. There's no limit compression braking sign there. It's just like Mate, get on the gas. Do it. <laughs> and the best thing is like not only is it like prime location, it's on State Highway 1, there's also a pub next door and it's called the Rat Hole. <laughs> now the, the Rat Hole has a um, the has an upstairs hotel, like a real, and it is a, how good, like I found this place, it's right next to a pub with a hotel was it only floods there once every three years? <laughs> no, I don't know. This it's just one upstairs. of those like classy. Yeah, classy. You know, like, hey, we're at the pub. We've got upstairs hotel. The clientele. And then I um, I'm that confident. I was like, hey, do you want to do building pest? Look, mate, I've got that. <laughs> don't need that. But you're laughing, <laughs> and I'll probably just manage it myself. <laughs> so although I live 600 k's north. I'm just going to advertise privately and get my own tenant in there and just manage it myself. How did you do that back in the days, so, though? Like, because there was no, like, uh, what's it, roommate? Fi- what's it called? Roommate? Fine. I think just word of mouth. I think there was a air, there's an Air Force base right by Bulls. Okay. So I knew people were there and they were like, hey, got this guy. Awesome, mate. Get him in there. So there was no vetting. There wasn't a sign with the um, number 10 times cut into a piece of paper at the rat hole, which is like, <laughs> take on interest. It could have been. Maybe next Mate, door. I wasn't that switched on. But, <laughs> um, and then I thought my mum, uh, around about the same time, my mum was selling a property too. I said to my mum, hey, I might buy another investment property. I've got this strategy where I just trip every two years. And then she's like, hey, I could sell you my house. I was like, how good? So I just bought my mum's house um, for 280 grand. Move my set to Auckland, that one though. That nah, was... in a little place called Fielding, just by Bulls. Okay. And um, that was, um, I moved my auntie in because I thought my auntie can move into this house. And then um, how good, she's family. I'm helping, she's going to help me. How good, you know, we're helping each other out. Oh man, then it gets crazy. So then <laughs> I come down because they're, they're both not paying rent because the, um, they're so can we that, go into some of the details so you tell me about the, the, the place next to the rat hole first. Okay, so the place the rat hole guy moves in, he's got his missus there. I turn up, they've got maybe eight dogs, German shepherds, like really big dogs running through the house. They've got possums out the back. This is pre knowing a clause of like tenant pays damage on, I'm you not even, on I'm, the grass. I'm not even sure, like I'm that confident, I'm not even sure I signed a tenancy agreement. There yeah. probably was, of but... Of course you wouldn't have been. You wouldn't have made license to pissed. sign one if you didn't. Yeah, it's like, hey, just jump in there, flick us some money, here's my account details, you know, like... Yeah. I turn up there, he's got eight dogs, they're running through the house, he's got pet possums, cats, he's just had... Pet twins. possums. Well, they had pet possums in cages out the back. <laughs> it's a Kiwi thing, they're a pest over there. Yeah, okay. But um, he had twins, two like little twin twins, maybe about three months old. I said, mate, you got to start paying your rent. Like, you're about four months in arrears. He said, hey, my wife's just about to um, kick off with some work. And then once she's back to full time, we'll be good. Cheers, you're a good tenant, eh? Good mate, landlord. Just good landlord. Mate, no stress. Just pay me when you can. Yeah. His wife starts work and then falls in love with the boss and moves in with him. That's too easy. So he's, he's a full-time truck driver with two three-month-old twins. He's got dogs everywhere and he, he's ringing me on the phone crying. Can you thank the possums when you're collecting the rent? <laughs> yeah, look after, I'm, I'll probably drive down and look after those kids and then it's killing me because I've got a good heart and I want to help them. My auntie's decided she doesn't have to pay rent either because she's family. So effectively I've got two boarding houses that you board for free in two towns. <laughs> that, um, oh. I just love it, eh? Oh, I so love good. it. So tell us a story about your auntie or do you want to go? Okay. Ah, she won't. Is it too much? It. No, it's okay. So my auntie got a bit behind her rent and I said, hey, why don't we, um, the guys moved out of the place by the rat hole. <laughs> I need to do some renovating. How about <laughs> you guys come it. and you guys come and help me? 
we'll paint this place up, we'll build some decking out the back, we'll make it look schmicko. I'll pay you like, I can't remember, I can't remember, like 20, 30 bucks an hour cash to come and work for me. Yeah. So they spent like quite a while, it might have been one, maybe two weeks working on this place. We painted the whole house in and out, done the decking. She goes, hey Clay, that'll be say three grand. And I'm like, cool. I just got to say this like off camera, you like the tone. I was like, that'll be three grand, please. Like, so that'll be three. She was so stoked, like, that'll be three grand. I'm like, that'll be five grand because you owe me five grand rent. So she looked up standing. Were you she, thinking about this? Or yeah, 100%. Okay, yeah. so you're like. Because they're not going to pay me. So I'm like, how can I. Okay. If, if they work, I can get like some waiver. I, I'll probably go to jail for this. But, <laughs> but it means, so she's like, hey, Clay, that'll be three grand. I'm like, well, you owe me five. So when you flick me five, <laughs> I'll pay you three. She's like, but I don't, I don't have five. And I was like, well, I don't have three. So we're at a bit of a stalemate. So thank you so much for helping me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The life, the life. And then she, like, she realized at this point that it's time to move out. And um, it's yeah. 2024 at the time of filming this and you haven't heard from them in 15 years. She's got, I, she's don't, I, I don't know if I've spoken to her since then. Okay. Like it, it's, <laughs> like, it's bad to be laughing about it, but as I said, like you can't, you got to laugh about this stuff because otherwise, otherwise you've got to cry about it. I've got two properties that I don't even rent out. <laughs> I've finally got two properties that are in my own occupied homes that are not grown in value at all. And um, So talk to me about that. Like... Now you're starting to become a real investor. It's like okay, <laughs> I'm pretty savvy, like... and you know the the trouble has been if any of my mates ask me that, like, man, Clay's got two properties. I was more than happy to talk them through how to be a property investor. Yeah, and you two properties, like you are killing it. I am killing it until I go to sell them because I decide my wife wanted to do Iron Man. We've got to move to Australia. Hey, let's sell these two properties. I get a contract to sell on the rat hole one that I brought for one ten. Eight years later. Eight years later, brought for one ten. I'd spent 15 grand renovating it, got offered 125. So I've just made <laughs> no money. <laughs> but the person signed the contract, pending building and pest. Remember, I didn't get a building and pest. They'd done the building. Didn't even know what it was. Didn't need it. Like, I'm, I'm, my confidence is so high. They'd done the building and pest. They found out that there's that much damage. The house is rotten. They're willing to offer me 60. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I'm like, <laughs> I'm like now in it for a like, sixty-five thousand dollar loss <laughs> on a property that's cost me stack load. So I said, look, I can't sell it to you for that. So I think I can't remember. I ended up getting off a later for like one twenty-five, yeah. but without building and pest, and we just rolled with that, and I cut my losses. Yeah, I, I think I made a little bit of money, maybe like ten grand on the other one, but um, yeah, not you know. I've, been investor for 11 years now and i just haven't made one made, one made 10 grand. grand yeah yeah made 10 grand okay so how's confidence <sighs> feeling about investing at that point because nah, this is but, this but, is real because i've been banged as you know like we've had laughs as well yeah. you get you you either get someone to help you yeah or you know someone that can help you like family you know or friend or colleague that's done it really well yeah. Or you just learn the hard way. I learned the hard way, just like you Me know. too. Like, yeah. own money. Every time I went to try and make easy money, no systems, no process, no plan, no team, no advisors, no community, like all this stuff. And plus being OCD with information overload all the time and like thinking I was like a little hustler back in the <laughs> days of like, because my first, my second property did triple in value as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> mate, how good. And um, my first one didn't, um, and you know, and then it's like I can make this hundred k over here, and then lose fifty k trying to make hundred k. Yeah. So you know, where where did your confidence get you to at that point when you'd moved to Oz? Was it like you know, property's not was property like not good at that point in your mind, or was it like there's potential, but there's got to be a better way to do it? That's a good call. So I, I could definitely see potential. Oh, and the reason Still I probably, hanging on the, the reason I, one. But the reason I see potential is the guy that told me about the five hundred grand property in Auckland, Auckland market, as you probably know, like you know your figures for sure, was probably like Sydney. Like he's now probably got a two million dollar property. The most profitable <laughs> market in the world since the last GFC update was Auckland. <laughs> Toronto but, maybe. <laughs> but I decided to buy in a rat hole. So therefore Auckland market's gone skyrocket. I can see, wow, that property if I had bought it, which I didn't, would be awesome. So I moved to Sydney and 2010 when my wife wanted to do Ironman mm -hmm. I had like 
10 grand in my pocket we moved to australia she started racing i had a good job working for the australian defense force fixing up some of the military aircraft out at richmond you know richmond now yeah air force base had a good job saved really good money we had five of us living in a share house put on by the military yeah put on by the contractor yeah and we just all um got paid good money but had low expenses so we really saved a lot of money there yeah and then um, i thought man maybe i should buy in sydney in like 2011 okay and that was just coming off <sighs> it had done one percent a year for the nine years up until 2012 yeah. so it was the bottom of the sydney market but no way. No, they're too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> no, to not it. a chance. So I, <laughs> luckily I didn't go buy, I decided, look, it's 2011, I've got a deposit to buy a house in, in, um, in Sydney. Mm -hmm. I think it's too expensive. I can't see this going up. Yeah. Once again, there's my knowledge, you know, I but still got Everyone problem. was saying that about Sydney. They're like, Sydney was a poor investment at that time because the living memory was it hasn't done anything for 10 years. Yeah. So yeah, there was probably that going on too. There's always people, um, there's always two sides of the coin. You know, I see to my job, people say, hey, you know, property market's going to crash tomorrow. Next people say, oh, mate, property's going to double tomorrow. You know, somewhere in the middle is where the truth is, you know. And I guess the thing I like about, I started following you guys when I come to Australia, Ben, and I feel like um, I hear a lot of opinions from people about here's what I think. And I say, oh, why do you think that? Oh, I just do. So, oh, wow, that's um, <laughs> not real, not great. No, back in there, whereas I think you guys I are, have some opinions as well, and it didn't work yeah, out for me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, had the, I had the best opinions ever, but one in three times it works out every time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. It's actually it was a bit about painful. two from six for me. It's about a bit painful just thinking back, like, yeah, oh, I don't mean to give you a hard time about it, but I like I wanted to have a bit of a laugh on this with you as well because it's only because we both like, and I, we should do a reverse one so I can like, yeah, I can, I can pick on you, I can pick on you. But so, the, so then I was living there and I thought, man, I'm not buying in Sydney. I did live in Queensland for a little bit. Maybe I want to buy some land and build because I'm working on this really tough job in Sydney. I don't like engineering, remember? I want to get out of this and do something different. So one Australia Day weekend, I flew to Pridgen and in, in, um, Sunshine Coast. Yeah. I went around to all the land sales markets and said, today I'm buying a block of land. Love that. I found a block of land. I brought it. Pridgen and Springs. Pridgen Springs. Yeah. I went and saw they had the um, the um, sales, the show homes there. I went and met with three show home guys. First guy said, oh, mate, oh, it's a bit tough, the house I wanted, because I wanted a house in Granny Flat. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to work with you then. If you're, I haven't even shown you anything and you're already thinking it's tough. tough as an idea. Next guy went and saw Steve, and Steve said, mate, we can do that. Done. So in one weekend, I brought land, and I've got my builder organized. I went back to Sydney, oh, God. and it was like I... I had a spring in my step because I knew I've got a plan to get up there. You know, no matter how much I'm working in Sydney, I will be in Queensland at some point. I love that. Mm. And just for the lifestyle, right? Like Auckland and Sydney, weather-wise, isn't dissimilar, but Queensland, 300 days a year of sunshine's oh, how pretty good. cool. How good? It's off the hook. The, the difference is in Queensland, if you organise a barbecue and it rains, people are really disappointed that it's raining. Yeah. Yeah. In New Zealand... If you organise a barbecue and it's good weather, you're stoked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you'll be like, oh wow, we even got good weather. <laughs> Whereas here, a barbecue here, people go, oh man, the weather's bad. You know, like, yeah, they have different expectations. So you've picked up this piece of land and this was, what year roughly was this? 2016. 16. So this is a perfect time to look at Queensland too, because Sydney's already gone through by 16 like from 11 to 16 sydney had gone through the first wave and then it went through another one between then and 19 but the queensland sunny coast hadn't like you must have got that land for a steal we won't go into okay, the numbers yeah. but yeah got a steal and built for like a steal you, you can't build for that now so we've got a really good situation can't build the granny flat for that now no that's what? right and we've got our house granny flat it's really separate it's awesome love it can see the ocean from where i am yeah it's um or a glimpse but you can see the ocean and so while it was an investment you might have got a few tax benefits on the depreciation report or was it always yeah. a yeah so it's from your videos i just started becoming a fan yeah and i um, started watching the videos learn about depreciation i got a depreciation schedule on the granny flat yep so that way i could make that i split my home loan so i had even though it was my house and granny flat the granny flats investment so i have an investment portion and i have the depreciation on that granny flat Gold, so you're doing it absolutely the way that it should be done, which mm. is if you're going to do something like that, so separate them, 
So you've got income that's covering some of the home loan. You've got a beautiful home to live in. Yeah. And you've got some tax benefits. Then you've also got the right timing. Yeah. You've bought a market that we now know does 9% a year yeah. for the last 100 years straight. And you've got the lifestyle that you and your wife have always wanted. Because as an athlete, she would have been wanting to like, this is the place to live and train. That's why so many pros live here, right? Yeah. Yeah, like it's sure. pretty safe on the roads. The roads are pretty good. They're pretty flat. But mainly you can train 300 days a year without wet weather. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. It, it, it's amazing. Like, remember, I grew up in the most boring town in New Zealand. So I pinch myself up there and just think, man, how good. You know, like I got two little boys. I live in a place that's amazing. I, yeah, I just love it. I'm filming in Ben's garage that's been converted to a podcast studio and it's ah, raining outside. It, it is raining. Get any better. I got my jacket on. Yeah. <laughs> it is actually cold. Like on the way here, I thought, this is like being in New Zealand. But the good thing is, give it a week. I'll be complaining because it's too hot. Yeah, give it the savvy. Yeah, give it the savvy. Yeah. Um, so you bought that property, you got set up and established in there for a little while. At this point, you were already considering jumping careers. Um, you'd been considering it, but you weren't ready to do that yet. I. I'd been nagging, remember I'd been nagging my wife for like, what, like 10 years that I want to get out of engineering, not nagging, asking politely. Yeah. Our boys were born, you know, two little boys. I bought another, I won't get into too much about it, but I made other decisions about investing and made some good decisions there. And also I had, um, in the meantime, reached out to you. Yeah. And um, I'd taken the courage to move forward with, we bought that place in, um, down in Clontarf. Yeah, which are the northern beachside suburbs. Yep. Um, at that time, man, if we had a crystal ball, like that was yeah. pretty, I wish I'd bought more there as well. If only, yeah. If, imagine if I had bought in Auckland, then moved to Sydney, bought in Sydney, you know, like... Then you can't, you, Coast, then Like Brisbane, you said, you've got to laugh at a rational cry, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. 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 And then, yeah, you guys helped me with my, with my investment property there and I really found a lot of wealth in that. Which is why I've um, you know, you, I'm buying two with you at the moment, which yeah. is um, yeah, pretty cool. That's really exciting, man. So all in all, there'd be the first land, the two in NZ, the one on the sunny coast, the investment in Brisbane, and now two more. So it will be seven properties over a 15, 20 year journey by the end of it all. Plus, which is plus pretty maybe, crazy. Plus maybe one more. Yeah, plus you took the land. Yeah, it's been. There's been some definitely some wins and some losses there, but yeah. you got to learn from your losses and take your wins. You know, what are some of the big lessons as an investor you've learned before we go into what I'm interested in asking, which is some of like the nitty gritty inside stuff around broking and what's coming next. But um, what have been some of the big lessons that you've learned along the way? And if you were doing it, knowing what you now know, like what would your advice for yourself be? It's a good question. It's a good question, Ben. And I think that um, for me, the biggest thing is knowledge, like just building a knowledge, like that, I oh mean, we'll pl I'm plugging your videos here, but watching your videos and just building my knowledge around, oh man, you know, that uh, you're buying a property for me at the moment. And I mentioned to other Ben that works for you, hey, I found this property. What do you think about this one? He goes, oh, Clay, it's on a main road. It's probably, you know, like, you don't want to buy on a main road. I'm thinking, I should buy oh, on a main road. Mate. I just want to stay how I won in New Zealand. Like, <laughs> you know, like that, that's, that's a prime example of, in my mind, I was like, how good? Like he's got a direct access to stay how I won. You guys point out like, that's not a good thing. Like <laughs> a truck's going past your door every day and night forever is not, not sharp. So just building knowledge and the people, the people that have come to me from you who come into help, you know, some help buying a property. I find them great. I had a great chat to a guy, Jonathan, last night, pretty late. We had like a 50 minute chat just about property. And he had some really great questions just because he's a big fan of yours. He's watched your videos. And his questions were like really good questions. Like he was asking me, not what's LVR, you know, how much should I buy for? He's asking me questions that were, you know, how can I get around paying LMI if I'm buying investment? Yeah, just had some really, we had a real good conversation. Can I say something? Like this is something that I picked up before I had a broker. I'd, so at this time I'd owned my third property, I was trying to buy my fourth. I couldn't afford to buy my fourth because I was working with one of the big four banks and they. I realize now that an internal writing policy at that time was like, if you had more than a million dollars of debt and you were below it, it was like an age bracket, they wouldn't oh, really? let me go. Like it was crazy, man. I only found this out later though. But I remember going in there and going, if I put down 
this deposit. Like I just sit with the bank manager in my lunch hours and just go through LMI. And I remember going, I don't have a 20% deposit. I don't have a 15. And I got her to put $500 until we went to 10% and show me what LMI would be. Oh, yeah. And LMI on 10% is really high. Yeah. Not really high. It's a cost of business. It's I'm happy to pay 10 grand if the market goes up by 10 grand in the next year on top of it. But there was a point between about 12 and 13%. I'm not sure if you've ever played with it as well. I'm sure you have where it went from like, seven and a half grand at 12 percent to like two thousand dollars at 13 and i went what did i just find and she's like it's called they call it internally the lenders mortgage insurance threshold and i'm like why the fuck isn't everybody talking about this Mm. is all i could say and then i'm like why have i been putting down 10 percent deposits when i was sitting on 12 and a half percent deposits in cash and could have saved myself 10 grand she's like well it's not in our best interest as a bank to yeah, tell people damn. about that. And I went, I'll never work with a bank directly again. Wow. And that's when I went and found my first broker. But yeah, like those little tips and tricks, like I didn't learn that until property four. There's people that never learn that, that, you know. Yeah. And it's like, not everyone's in a position to put 12 or 13% down, but if you are versus 10, the, the, there's gonna be mm-hmm. life-changing savings. It's, it's huge. Now that this really cool one, Sorry, it's, I don't know why no, no, it's, it's go really good. No, it's really, it's a good call. It's really exponential. How much, like, if you've got eighty-one percent LVR, you know, the LMI is not too much. Like, you probably get away with it. Yeah, I've got a couple of guys buying an investment property. He wants to keep cash in his business rather than do that, and he's happy to pay a little bit of LMI to keep that Cost cash on the side. You know, right? yeah. But if you get round, if you go to, so ANZ will do ninety-five percent lend plus LMI up yeah, to 90 which is exactly 90 how it was in 2011 12 13 like and but the lmi on that is like you might be paying like oh, it depends on the property value but 30 35 grand now added to the loan and they added know to the way take interest on that over 30 years they're probably making 200k on lending you 30 percent 30 grand up front yeah and and I look, just made that number up. By yeah, the yeah. Way. Like all our numbers, punished. all like, our numbers are just. Be, yeah, yeah someone will look that up. Actually, Ben, it is. Uh, Sorry, guys. Here. Sorry, my team. But the other thing is, as a broker, like I said at the start, it's really easy to be. Um, I'm just not buy some. I'm here to help. You know, like for example, if you're a first home buyer, there's schemes available where you can buy with five percent deposit. Mm-hmm. You know, LMI. ANZ doesn't use that scheme. Yeah, they might forget that if. Hopefully they wouldn't, but if you went in there as a first home buyer, of course they will help you. Mm-hmm. But if you go to another bank or a broker, Westpac, CBA, NAB, whatever, they will have this scheme where you can save maybe 15 grand, 17 grand in LMI. Big you know? deal. And you just knowing that and being impartially able, this is why I've always worked with brokers. And I would just say, well, I haven't worked with you personally. Like yeah. so many of my clients have, and that's not for any reason except I haven't actually bought a property in the last couple of years yeah. since you've gotten really, really, really good at this stuff. Yeah. But um, I just um, I just think it's one of those things where it's like you don't know what you don't know and what options there are unless you're inside the space day in, day out. And ANZ might reverse that policy. Like that's obviously a policy of we want business right now yeah. because they're looking at their balance sheet and going, well, it's not we're not sitting on a risky balance sheet because everyone's properties went up 50% since COVID. Yeah we're in a good position let's lend some money and then that that'll close and then another bank's like well our position looks better now and you've just got to know where to go when i've been with anz nab westpac macquarie cba and liberty over 15 years as an investor i have two of those banks that i prefer from a service perspective and from an online perspective i won't say what they are no that's fair i think it's better for you because i have all the you know all the majors on my panel and relationships with each bank i have a relationship manager that i deal with yeah i think it's easier if we just say yeah. bank x yeah but i don't necessarily bank with them just because their online profile is cool and when i right. ring the phone someone picks up it's more their policies change and as an investor i want the best rate possible with an offset account with with semi-favorable terms where they're not trying to take some of my blood and my kids um, yeah. to get me a loan across the line yeah so so what are some of the reasons people should consider working with a broker versus working with a bank manager 
my experience personally, and I'll just say this because it's a loaded question because you are one. Like mm. it's a loaded question, That's me good. talking about property because I'm a buyer's agent and I love property, um, is obviously choice is why I work with a broker. I don't want to go into one bank and get one product. I want to be able to look at a panel of 20 banks and four of them really closely and go this one for this reason. But outside of the variety, like why do you think it's cool for people to look at brokers? Yeah, there's a bit of a loaded question, but yeah, yeah I obviously but... always go to a broker, but I genuinely I think um because we're genuinely there to help, yeah. Um, well you yeah. are. Like not every experience I've had with every, like you're yeah, true. you're a unicorn. There's other brokers out there that are just there to take the upfronts and the comms too. Yeah. But a lot of those guys got busted in that thing that they did a few years back in there. They got the slap, so. Yeah. No, I, I guess um, I'm a real geek on this. Like, never invite me to a party because I'll just talk about bank policies. And, um, <laughs> you know, like, I need to get out more. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in general, like, just I found out things like, um, we'll just say Bank X offers you a discount. On the portal, okay, you buy an investment property to make you money, yeah? You don't buy an investment property to make the bank money. Although they will make money. They make money, yeah. But you want to make it more about you making as much as you can in the bank as less as possible. You know, yeah. you having the best rate with Bank X is going to be, um, Bank X will be fine, that your rate's good, but it looks after you, yeah. Um, for example, if you got Bank X, I can request a discount with that bank as fast as you can probably send two texts, yeah. So I go on the portal, I could type in your details, your home loan number, discount request, apply. I had a guy who used, I used to work with at McDermott's. Um, he rang me up and said, hey, Clay, I'm with, I can't remember what bank he was with CBA. He said, hey, Clay, can you help me with a discount? Wait there, Ted. I jumped on there. Mate, I got him a 0.8 discount, and I said to him, it'll be applied overnight. Can you ring me tomorrow and confirm that discount has been applied? On a million dollars, just I think so he, that he had a few properties too. That's 8,000 bucks a year. Mm. Like it's serious money. This is why I take working with a broker so seriously as well because you, you're you're wholesale to them because you're, you're not Ben Everingham dropping in one loan every two years. Yeah. You're like Clay who's dropping in 50, 100, 150 loans. I'm not sure what it yeah. is and we don't have to go there, but a lot of loans a year. And so they're seeing you differently because you're one to many where I'm just one to one. It's yeah. kind of like I buy 150 properties a year or 100 a year and I'm buying 20 off one agent. Of course, they're going to give me yeah. more information than walking off the street into the first open home. So there's obviously the variety. There's the knowledge. Yeah. There's the discounts. What else do you help people with? I think the education is so important. It, there's a it, whole financial education you've got to go through to understand it. There's so much and you can't even just know it and then it's always changing, yeah? An example would be the first home buyer scheme that you can buy a 5% deposit, no LMI, yeah? Two years ago, you had to buy with your spouse, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or, your, you know, it changed last year to you can now buy as a permanent resident. You don't have to be a citizen. A lot of people wouldn't know that because they got turned down by it two years ago because they weren't a citizen. They're a permanent resident. Now... You can be a permanent resident and use the same scheme without being a citizen. Without being a citizen, so always check in. Just because you got told no by our bank, that's just a, it. Can be a big yes from another bank. Yeah. Also the um, oh man, I could rattle this off for that. Like yeah, just hours. throw some but, stuff in. This is educational, okay. like for all of us. We're not talking about you being a broker and talking positive about breaking. We're like, if people are sitting on a bank manager because they're that's who their mum banked with. Mm or it was a family friend, or that's who you've always done it with. So I'll always stay there. Yeah. For me, when I was making those decisions, firstly, it was costing me 1% more per year on $2 million of interest, which was 20K a year. Yeah. Secondly, they were saying no when I had more capacity with another bank to continue to move forward. And yeah. that decision cost me 700K on the property that I missed out on. So I... This isn't about broking. This is about just fucking understanding the industry properly so that you can better yourself and get to financial freedom sooner. Okay. I'm sorry about the rant. No, that's good. That's good. It. I get passionate too. Um, like the scheme now, you can buy with a brother. You can buy. I've got two brothers. Using, the scheme changed last year. Not a you sister? Can, 
It can be brother or sister. <laughs> maybe your sister. What if I have my sister? She'll probably watch this. <laughs> oh, your auntie, but... <laughs> no, I'm not your auntie, but... You can buy with anyone now using the scheme as long as you're both first home buyers. Two people buying a house. I've got two brothers buying a house and building. Um, wow. You know, that's pretty cool. If maybe, if maybe you're a builder and you've got a plumber, mate. Go buy your first home, renovate it, build some equity that way. You know, that wasn't an option in the past. Um, so they'll let you do the first home buyer's scheme at the moment with a partner. With, with a, it can be, a, um, it doesn't have to be a spouse. Wow. Just two people, not three, it has to be two. That's a huge deal because I bought my first two properties with mates because I couldn't afford the deposit on mm. my own and I, I wanted to get into the market and I was scared. Mm. And it split the risk because two incomes, if one of us loses one, it felt like less of a jump. Yeah. My brother-in-law's just did the same thing too. Oh, there you go. Bought together because it was like an easier step in than, you know, jumping out of the plane. And it's like you might have that friend you can work with, you know what I mean? Like it's a big step, you know. Don't just go and don't have that high confidence, low knowledge. Try and have some <laughs> knowledge and jump in there. Love but that. The um, other good things like just things like um, if you're self-employed, most banks require two years tax returns, yeah. There are banks that only require one. Mm -hmm. You know, for a lot of people, if they had a tough time in COVID and um, you know, it might be in their best interest to use the one year tax return because, you know, your years change if you're self-employed. You know, hey, here's my most recent tax return. It's um, a bit grander than the last one. Hey, let's just go to a bank that uses one year tax return. So here's a real world example of this. Like imagine you're a business owner working with a bank manager that's like, we need two years and you're like, cool. Two yeah, years. because you won't know that. And whereas I was, if I get someone, hey, mate, I've had a look. It's been a lot greener this year. We're going to go to a bank that just requires one bank state, one tax return in isolation. It just opens up so many doors for you. Mm. If you go to someone needs two, they're going to take the average of the, you know, they might take the average or, yeah. So say someone sat down like a business owner, for example, or someone who's self-employed, someone who's doing whatever, sole trader, they've got... 12 months ago, they sat down with the bank and they said, two years from now, you can come back and talk to us. Yeah. And in that 12 months that they were waiting for that extra return, like yeah. the, let's say they did it two years ago and in the last 12 months, Perth, Adelaide and Brisbane all went up 15%. On a mm -hmm. million dollars, that's $150,000 gain that person missed out on because of the wrong advice. It's like going to Toyota and asking for a Ford. Yeah. You can't do it and everyone gets that. But people go to like their banks and expect the bank to be able to give them forward when they're actual Toyota and they can't. But but they might not even be proving you the wrong advice. They're just giving you the advice they what have. They can in their they only know They only know what you know. And I guess I'm not saying, I'm saying if you're a property investor and you've got a good broker, make sure you're asking for those discounts because it doesn't take them long to do. If he says, hey, oh, mate, I haven't got time. It doesn't take them long to just plug into the computer, request a discount. It might get approved. It might not, but at least you try. I've got a I've got a friend um, Paul Paul's a common enough name you won't know who he is but he um he banks for the bank one of the biggest banks in in Australia he loves them loves the app but he's been with them so long they know he's not leaving and his interest rates high and he had a, say a million dollar loan yeah mm -hmm. I asked for a discount they said nah he's been you know he's been with us that long we don't they know the likelihood he's not he's not really. going to leave so I said hey Paul he's like, I made I love my bank and I said why don't we go to bank number two just for a year. You can jump across to bank number two, but get their new to bank rate. And then lately we've just put him back to bank one with a cashback offer and he's um, new to bank again, but he's, he's on a really sharp rate. It just meant that he, um, yeah. So let's talk about this for a second, just for my own interest, like rates are a contentious thing at the moment and we'll talk about where they might be going because the cool thing about being a top performing broker is you go to a CBA lunch or br bruncheon mm. or brekkie <laughs> or pit the piss. I don't know what people do these days with these banks or what they're allowed to do, but you find out things that I don't get access to except through relationships with people. Um, and so, you know, there's people out there at the moment with fixed interest rates still at 2% that haven't rolled over. Mm -hmm. And there's people out there that I've seen get 9% rates in self-managed super and there's everything in between, but what's, a sharp rate for a mum and dad looking to buy their own home this year? What's a sharp rate for an investor that's buying, say, Brisbane if they're living in Sydney or Melbourne right now? Okay, so if you're... Uh, in the current market, and this is, we're recording in July 2024, so obviously this is going to change as people listen to this later on. 
I, I guess I'm in a position now where I've been getting really busy, good busy, right? When you start out, it's hard. Like, I'm trying to ring Westpac, they're, they're like, who's this guy? We're not answering. Now I get to, you know, hey, Claire, would you like to come have a coffee with us? You know, discuss op options, ideas. I guess the thing that factors your interest rate is there's factors like um, your LVR. Maybe you brought the property with a 5% deposit or a 20% deposit. Your rate's based on that. If you can, if your equity's increased, it tears. So if you have, if you've got under seventy percent, under sixty percent, that bank might rec might do a lower rate for you based on your LVR decreasing. So what you're saying there is banks assess risk. Yeah. They give you a worse interest rate for higher risk. Yeah. Which they don't have to do because their balance sheet is low risk. It should be but they're doing it because they know that you require that loan and you're going to pay that higher rate. Where yeah. if you're coming in with an LVR, a million dollar property that you're in the 500K on, that's very good business for them because it means when they take that on their balance sheet, they can lend yeah. more money to other people off that property they're picking up and they'll give you a better rate for that. Yeah, so it's just exactly. safety for the bank. And just, just negotiate a bit. Like if you've got a good broker, just say to him, you know, what rates can you offer me? And if he has a relationship, you can always reach out to your manager and say, look, I've got, this person's got three properties, you know, like I feel like you should really do good by them and give them give them a rate that's attractive. So I'm coming in as a first time buyer now, right now for my own home. Um, I've got a 10% cash deposit and then my sister's coming in as a first home and she's got a 20% deposit. What type of rate in the current market would be acceptable with like a big, First tier, second tier bank, six something. Maybe six, six point two or something. If you're using the scheme, a really sharp rate. Really sharp. You could get down to below six. Wow. Yeah. And it, what about an average rate? Say you're coming in, you're just scraping in. You're at the top of your capacity with a ten percent deposit. Are you in the sevens then? Nah, mid, mid sixes. Mid, mid sixes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. What I'm hearing is I'm being, everyone I'm being, listening I'm to being this. real gray there. Like, you know, I know. Because, I, yeah, I don't want to say a six point, but mid sixes, if you if you haven't got a six at the moment, just reach out to someone and ask for a discount. There's no harm in asking. Where else can you save $5,000 in a phone call? You know, no hey, can you offer me a discount? No. At least you tried. Yeah. Then ring around and say, even do a bit of research. Look up the best rate online. Hey, Bank X, I'm, you know, I can see you. This bank's offering me this one. Can you help, can you help me out? Because if you don't do that, I had someone last week, or a couple weeks ago, I would say last week, and it can be, it was actually probably I know what you mean, ago. it could be a year ago. <laughs> but they were on um, over 9% with a one half million dollar lend. And they're like, mate, can you do any better? I was like, oh, wow. Do Have you been to your bank? They're like, yeah, they said, they can't help me. I was like, wow. And they think, they think I've done, they think I'm a rock star because I've helped them get this great rate. They should have always been on that rate. You're saving that person over 40 grand a year. Yeah. You know, and why this is important to me is there's so many people, myself included, and I just want to open up my phone app as soon as we finish this and have a look at my rates and yeah. um, make a call. And if they won't change it, get you to change them. But there's a lot of people where the banks have just put them on like 6.8 to 7.2 to 7.4 at the moment. When the rates went up a lot, they just thought everyone was like, oh, like normally people would be looking because they went up so quickly. Um a lot of people are sitting on rates above what that bank would actually lend to them right now on. And I think it's a really important thing to reach out to your broker, to your bank, or to someone like Clay if you're just getting stitched up. Like now is a, the start of them becoming more competitive again, I believe, because at some point in the next couple of years, I believe we're going to see rate reductions, but I might be completely wrong. For sure. And, and be aware that um, when they're going up, Bank X might want to make sure they go up on the, as they go up yeah when they go you want to make sure you they don't on, pull them you want to make sure you keep it on top of that and just like hey you know i noticed the the cash rate went down last month you know perhaps that could come across to me and just make sure you keep on top of it say like, you're bank x as a business and you've got 10 billion dollars worth of property loans in australia and they're all sitting half a percent above when the loans come back down and you're not just gonna you're not gonna roll them over until people call you that's your internal policy because legally they can set whatever they want. Like their intention might be to pull it down, but not straight away. Because yeah. if they can get an extra 1% for, or half a percent on $10 billion for three just months. Just delay it for a little bit, yeah. You're talking tens of millions of dollars of profit. 
And it's this is how these guys think. Like I work with heaps of these bankers as clients and you know, just got to understand that they're in the business of making and printing money out of thin air and they're, they're smart. Like they don't miss anything. What about a self-managed super fund rate at the moment? Like, is it still true that you need to be putting down 30, 40% cash deposits to buy? Are the rates still sitting at eight, 9% for those or are they starting to normalize now as well? Are the banks open to that business again? So I, I, one of the properties I'm doing with you at the moment is with my self-managed super fund. Yeah. And I think the rate I'm getting six, just under seven. That's insane. And that's 20%. With 10% left over for a rainy day as a buffer? In Depends the on account. the bank. Some will want some want 20% with a buffer, some don't require buffer. Remember, bank policies are all different, yeah? Yeah. I've also, um, man, I feel I'm aware of boring people with stats, but I'm aware that some banks... Good contribution last year. The year before wasn't good. Therefore, my last two years average is not great. Um, because I'm self-employed, the super, the some funders will say, "Hey, if you can get an accountant there stating that you're going to do this much next year, therefore your average is the same. You have a higher amount that you can put towards your super fund." Yeah. Some banks will let you use an accountant letter. Some won't. I'm using an accountant letter because if I put pluck a number 25k into my super last year, mm -hmm. my accountant said, "Hey, he's probably going to do the same. He's going to do the same this year. Therefore, 25 is the number. Don't worry about the five he done because uh, the five and 25 is only yeah a lot less." interesting man hmm. what other tips and tricks are there for people out there in terms of this space like where do you see people making the majority of their mistakes as investors coming to broke different question how can people set themselves up before they come to you to be in a good position for a bank to consider them for a loan and how can they increase their borrowing capacity like what are tips and tricks for the average person who's struggling to get a loan at the moment but only because of the advice they're receiving or because of the way they've got things looking i reckon don't even don't even put a lot of work in yourself just ring someone like if my car's broken i don't just fix it i don't spend like four days out there trying to figure out what's wrong take to a mechanic get an opinion hey clay i think this is broken here's how much i think it'll cost cool go get a second opinion you know like get opinion build your knowledge that's the key i think if um Oh, another example, I've got someone at the moment, they're an audiologist, yeah? Um, each, a lot of banks have a medical policy where if you're a medical professional or um, in finance, if you're an accountant, chartered accountant, you can have LMI waivers. So a doctor with some lenders can have a 5% deposit, no LMI, he's a doctor, yeah? We've, more, we've worked with more than 60 doctors in the last nine years and every single time I'm like, man, no LMI. And that's, it's for, that's forever. That's for investment. That's for your life. You're at ninety five percent LVR, no penalty. Yeah, ninety percent for nurses with some banks. Audiologist sneaks un under some banks. Westpac class an audiologist as a medical professional. Other banks don't. Whereas a physiotherapist, you know those grey, mm. a vet is a vet medical. Some banks yes, some banks no. So if you're in those professions where, just get a, get an opinion. Hey, my, I'm a, my partner's a vet oh wow you should go to the medical policy there's one where if you're a professional athlete some banks are having a professional athlete package where some bank will say hey you play nrl you earn this much money are you going to earn that for 30 years maybe not yeah <laughs> you might not play NRL definitely for not unless you like name <laughs> yeah. one Cameron but, smith but probably played for 15 years <laughs> like long as maybe you're a golfer you can get 30 years but other banks have a, have a, they realise that and they're saying, hey, maybe you can, um, I don't know, if you're an NRL player, you've probably got enough, you're probably motivated enough to get a good job in the future. Therefore, that they've got some options there. There's just a lot of, um, yeah. So talk to me about the benefits of having an offset account for anyone who hasn't got one set up or is new, because I know there's a lot of people listening to this, like, come on, Ben, like we know what an offset account is. Yeah. There's other people out here that are like, this is going to be their first property this year or ah. their first investment. Like you've got your home loan, which is the money you owe to the bank. An offset account is an account sitting next to that. But do you just want to explain the benefit and what it is? Awesome. So I feel like I need a little YouTube video. Some people ask me this. I can just go, please watch this video and I can have a chill and a coffee. Please watch it. this before we speak. <laughs> but these are the 50 most common questions I get asked every day. <laughs> this, would be, this would be the most common. Or maybe it's not the most common I'm asked. It's the most common I like to let people be aware because when they pick their loan do you want an offset account do you want redraw 
Yeah. So who says no? Someone that doesn't know what one is or someone that's really bad with so, saving. Sometimes the rate can be sharper if you don't have an offset account. Yeah. Sometimes we point one sharper. At, at the moment, it, it can be some lenders are actually cheaper with their, you can actually get pricing that's cheaper than their basic rate. So when you ask for pricing, you can get a cheaper rate than their basic. So if you have a basic home loan with no offset, the offset one's actually cheaper. It just has a fee. Some banks, ANZ's $10 a month. Yeah. CBA might be three ninety five a year fee. Yeah. So the way it works is, I use this, this is my story. It's my spiel. <laughs> <laughs> if, I've, if I've got a hundred grand. Left brain, right brain. Yeah. It's going into autopilot. <laughs> If I've got a hundred grand loan, yeah, and I've got ten grand cash, yeah. If I if I put that ten grand into my home loan, yeah, I now have that's called redraw. I can put the money into my home loan for redraw. I now have a home loan of a hundred k. I owe ninety. I'm only paying interest on the ninety. Yeah. And redraw means I can redraw that out any time, but I can, I have to put it into the home loan and pull it out, redraw it out. But I'm only paying interest on whatever's not in there. Yeah. Offset is the same, but you have an account. So CBA will let you have 99 offset accounts. You can have um, any money in those accounts is instantly offsetting your home loan. So if you have 10 grand combined in all your accounts and you have a home loan of 100K, you don't have to move it in there. The offset account is offsetting the interest, so you're only paying interest on 90. Love yeah. that. But one thing people get caught out is the repayment is still based on the 100. Yeah you're just taking away the interest. So people think if they... If you're paying principal and interest. Yeah. So if you, people think if they put 100 grand into their redraw or their offset, they're going to drop their repayment. The repayment won't drop, just the amount of interest drops. To actually drop your repayment, you've got to put that money into your home loan, actually make your home loan from 100 to 90. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that way your repayment will come down. Next question, man, that I've got. Like, I'm just geeking out on this, by the way. Um, we'll <laughs> I'm, I'm worried that I'm, I'm just here. like... Yeah, so I just I've been waiting to ask these questions because I can't legally talk about them. Obviously, yeah. I understand them. I could explain all of them, but I can't go into the nitty gritties because you're licensed to talk about that. I'm licensed to talk about property. The benefit of going principal and interest mm. versus interest only and why you'd choose principal and interest versus interest only at different stages of your own investment journey. And obviously, you're not an accountant or a financial advisor. This so is I can't, not I can't tell you. Yeah, don't, don't do what Clay says. I'm, but I'm talking about not just anyone's situation, more the pros and cons lists of like one way versus the other. And if I was, you know, you're working with Ben Everingham and you're getting advice from my accountant as well, like Dale from Pool Group. Yeah. And we're talking about my situation. What are the pros and cons of me paying P&I versus interest only? Okay. P and I, your rate's going to be sharper, so you're paying principal and interest. Almost half a percent better at the moment. Yep, I would say it's pretty accurate. I say that it's a real grey thing. Like every bank's different. Yeah. Some banks will have an appetite for interest only. Some will have. Um, if it's your own home, owner occupied, and your principal and interest, the banks love that. You can go interest only with some lenders on your own home, mm -hmm. but the rate's going to be probably more than. This is really great, but probably more than 0.5 higher because they don't like you having your own home interest only because they want you to pay that down. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got an investment property, you can go interest only and the bank's pretty relaxed on that because you can, maybe you want to pay down your home loan, your account will help you out here, but your investment property, the interest may be tax deductible. So you might not want to pay that down as fast as what you want to pay down your own home. So if you keep that on interest only, Although the rate is higher, so you are paying more interest. You're paying only the interest, but you're paying more interest than if you pay principal and interest. Mm -hmm. So my thoughts are, if you, for myself, my investment property is principal and interest, mm -hmm. and it means that I'm paying that down. I have the ability to, if I ever got stuck or got in a position where, hey, the rates are really creeping up, I'm getting a bit tight, I can flick that to interest only if I want to, which would mean that... Um, yeah, it's gonna. The interest is higher, but my repayment's lower. But just be wary. You might get it caught in the trap where you think, "I'll go interest only. It's gonna save me a stack load." It doesn't actually save you as much as you think. Yeah. Ask your broker to say, "Hey, if I'm interest only and my repayments, I'm plucking a number, right? Like my repayments. Oh, I don't even know. Your repayments this this much, interest only. By going P and I, 
your payment might only go up a fraction. Yeah, It might not be as big a jump as you think, but you're chipping away, you're paying less interest. And if you're in a position where you're living at home, you're buying an investment property, it might be, you might want to try and motivate yourself to build that equity or you might want to, yeah. So for me, like in my situation as an investor who's gone from start, like if you're thinking about as a business, startup phase to maturing, you know, go through different stages of growth cycles. I, I was interest only on all of my properties when I first started because the goal was to save as much money as I could for my next deposit and the principal was taking that away. Yep at that phase of my journey and I didn't want to use equity I wanted to use cash for my deposits mm -hmm. at that phase so when I was very first accumulating I had my all of my properties on interest only keep the income as high as possible the costs on the properties for me as low as possible went out and bought a bunch of properties then interest rates got really low um, a while back like a, it was very low for a, a while like Twos. Yeah, and even before that, like years and years and years sitting below 5% anyway, like there was a golden run of yeah. like things being very low because when I first started, I was at 9% after the GFC, like rates were very high, um, at least on the shitty rates that I was paying. Um, and then I watched them come down. I thought anything below 7% was good, then anything yeah. below 6%, then I, same as everyone else, got used to stuff below 5% and thought that was normal. But um, when the rates got low... And the difference between paying, like at one point, the difference between paying principal and interest was 1%. Yeah. So the 1% difference across my portfolio was the principal. And because yeah. the rates were so low, it made sense to wipe as much debt as quickly as I could. Yeah. And I'd also move from like buying being the focus, the paying off debt. And so I'm like, worst case scenario, if I put them all to 30 years, 25 years at principal and interest, I'll own them outright. Yeah. But I'm a, I'm a much better saver than my average client. Um, yeah. and I'm disciplined as hell and so and I'm very consistent so if it's like if I'm paying myself into an offset account I'm not touching it but I've got other clients that I'm like you know you need to be paying principal because I know you and I know that if you don't you know you're not gonna you're not gonna like put the tax in there the surplus rent in there like the extra bit per week in there like you need to be chipping away and putting it into redraw off the home loan because otherwise you're going to get caught out. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying that as advice. I'm more saying it as a behavioral habit. You're a spender or you're a saver. And that's a good, it's a good question, Ben. I think that, or a good comment. I think that that's just being aware of yourself. I'm aware that I'm probably not like that. If I have, if I've ever made money in my life, it hasn't been through saving. I won't put it into an account. I need to be paying P&I. And I think it's about being aware of yourself and go, man, I am the guy that needs to make a commitment to a bank to pay P and I, therefore it will happen. Yeah. If I yeah, sometimes especially with little kids, it's quite it's really you have to be quite strict to be Dad, Dad, can I have this yeah, Kush can mate. You know, like I need I, I need to be more Yeah. You know what I mean? Well I um I'm not strict with my kids. I'm very strict oh, with my bank account. No, but so just like, in general, if there's yeah. a, if there's, it burns a hole in my pocket sometimes, you know? Yeah, and I, um, so I've got like a, I pay myself, you know, a couple of thousand dollars per week or whatever. And I'm like, I'll spend that to zero every week. And I know for some people listening to this, that's a lot of money. For others, that's like, you're only living off a couple of grand a week. Like my lifestyle is not expensive. Yeah. Because I've sold 11 properties and paid endless amounts of tax it's enabled me to like create a lifestyle above my means because property has gone up in value. And yeah. I have had ones like yours that have done good. I've had ones that have done not good either. <laughs> Nothing probably as good as the rat hole the in rat such hole. short period of oh. time. But I, um, I think, you know, as interest rates started to creep up and my business and your business is very exposed to sentiment, the movement of money around the world. And if places, if property is going up, phones are ringing if property's going down phones are ringing if property's in the middle people are just like i'll just wait and see so i'd prefer to be in like a market like we are now than the market we were last year if you know what i mean yeah where just nothing's happening and everyone's in a holding pattern yeah but i think i i looked at the risk and i'm like i'm going to go back to interest only on everything because they normalize principal and interest loans at least with my bank were the same and I'm like, the downside risk is they can't get inflation under control. 
and I won't be able to refinance because my financials will look worse and I actually went interest only to protect my cash flow. Yeah. And so I suppose the reason I'm saying that is I bounce between a lot more than a normal person because I take advantage of temporary holes in the market. I also um, invest differently than a lot of other people as well because my exposure to risk from doing it for so long is probably like much lower than the average investor now as well. Like I, and so cash flow is very important. As you know, once you set, get, start getting more properties behind you, paying P&I on one property is cool. Paying P&I on Fuse at nine or something at one point I had, like is scary. Especially when your income is susceptible to the same changes that interest rates are, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I'm just hyper aware of that stuff, probably a bit more than I should be. And for the average person, every account in Australia is going to be like, pay P&I. Yeah. You won't even notice in 20 years that you paid off yeah. two thirds of your property. I think you're um, a bit outside the norm though, Ben. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like no one's, yeah, you're pretty sweet shine. You've learned a lot of lessons. You're, you know, you're a numbers guy and you're very... um savvy with what you do what you know and i probably play with it more than i need to mm. I, I wish you want to be more and p and i and everything yeah yeah i'd probably be in a way better financial position if i had to just chip maybe away. not you know I, I guess when you when you speak about um you're talking about refinancing there and getting harder mm. i've seen trends lately at the moment if your interest rate six yeah the bank will assist you for a purchase at nine they're still doing that three so they're three percent buffer there's talk of it maybe coming down. Some banks are now doing a 2% buffer. So I've got Bank F that will now um, do a 2% buffer. For a lot of people, that 1% means they can borrow 60 grand more, which means that, hey, they're, they're the best option for me. And they're, they're what's called a conforming lender, so they don't have a higher rate or penalty for that. So I've been sending a bit of work that way just because, hey, this guy needs a bit more. I had one who was buying off an um, advantageous purchase of his dad. His dad was gifting him the deposit and he was buying a property off his dad. Hey, we need to go to this bank because you can't afford any other bank, yeah? Mm -hmm. Some banks are doing a 1% buffer, non-conforming lenders. I reckon from what I'm sensing and the knowledge of the long-term cycle, like easier credit is the next mm. thing to come through. So let's talk about some of the things that are happening at the moment that you're noticing like this. Yeah. So I just wrote an email on this that gets sent out today at 12 o'clock. We might have to rewrite it. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's some big stuff coming. Mm. So you've got this trust account thing, which I'll get you to talk about in a second. Yeah. You've got these first home buyers grants. You've got lowering interest rates potentially. You've got the buffer that was set by APRA in you know, 2019 yeah. or even as far back as 17. Um, what else is going on like? What's what and what do you see coming in terms of them softening so that they can lend more money out? There's a bank I've been using at the moment. They're offering a 40 year loan term. They're offering 1% servicing buffer and they're considering all other debts. So if, if you have four properties interest only, say you've got four properties interest only at 6%, the thing that, the thing that hurts you buying your next one is the bank assesses all them at nine. Mm -hmm. They shade your rental income by 80 or 90 percent. Uh, 20 percent. So they cut it from 100, like 500 a week to 400 would yep. be 80 percent. But now some banks are doing 90. Okay. And some banks have changed their policy where we'll take 90 or 80, but we don't require any expenses incurred for your investment property because that's the 10 or 20 percent that we're not factoring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some banks will say we'll take 80 percent of the income, but we also don't need any... Um, extra expenses done around the investment property because that's the 20% we're not factoring, yeah? Mm -hmm. Whereas some banks will take 80%, plus you've got to put your expenses in, plus they're adding a higher interest rate, so they're making the loan more expensive and reducing your income, so every property buys harder. This bank I've been using, I'd rather not say the name, but they, they will use, what is your current outgoing for repayments, and they'll just use that number. Mm -hmm. And they'll take... I think 90% of the rental income and they'll take 1% buffer. It means you can get, you can buy another property with them if you, if you um, want to. So when I say the cycle, like based on hundreds of years worth of data in books like Phil Anderson's The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking or Fred Harrison's The Power and the Land, both up there, The Secret Wealth Advantage by Akil, like he looked at the same amount of data too. 
these guys, I'm saying up here, but I'm forgetting that we're on a podcast. Some people will be watching this, most of it. Um, the most likely thing that happens next is if you think about it from a bank's perspective, right? One third of people in Australia don't have any home loan at all because they own the property outright. And a lot of those people still have that title deed with the bank. Yeah. So a third of the bank's debt is no debt. And yeah. it's got a $2 million property in Sydney with zero debt, but the person doesn't want to get the title back. Then there's a third of Aussies that rent. And then there's a third of people in Australia that have, you know, home loan, right? Yeah. Of those people that have home loans, the average LVR, according to CoreLogic, and some of those guys that I look at is sitting below 50% now after the last 10 years of incredible growth in many markets in Australia. Yeah. Like if 70% of Australia's wealth is tied up between... Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth, and the property values are there. And the average LVR sitting there is below 50% because all of those markets have gone up 50% in the last 10 years plus. These banks are like sitting on the probably the best balance sheets that they've sat on in a long time because they haven't been allowed to lend. Lending has been so bloody hard and people have been so frightened for like the last five years. Yeah. They are just craving to lend but then you've got a government that's saying we want inflation to be under control and we've got APRA who is saying from something that they needed to put in in 2017 in Sydney but they applied it to Australia and they haven't removed it, this 3% buffer, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. Like it saves us from going into the crises that America and stuff go through. But it's also just like these banks are like they want to make money. They make money by creating debt. And they make money from interest. Yeah. And I believe that there's a shitload of things being manufactured like there was at the end of the last cycle right now that we'll see in the next two years that are just like, they just want to lend because mm. their balance sheets look good and their profitability is down. I don't know, another rant there. But no, that's good. I, Everyone loves a bin rant. That's why we're on. I'm here for a rant every now and then. In terms of like any last little tips or tricks or anything else you wanted to round out the conversation... Um, with for anyone that's listening today, uh, property investment advice, ideas, or not advice, but ideas, broking stuff that you're loving at the moment, grant stuff that you've been hearing through the grapevine that hasn't quite made its way through the mainstream media yet, anything like that? Oh, there's so many. Like, um, like I said, I could just ramp for ages, but things like guarantor, say you don't have a deposit. Yeah, say you've got, you don't have the deposit, you've got the income you want to buy your first time, yeah? A guarantor is a prime example of where your parents, okay, some banks need it to be your sibling, child, or parent to be a guarantor. Yep. Some banks will let your grandparents, some parents, some banks will let your uncle, maybe cousin, wow. be a guarantor. I thought it was only over your parents, like that's not nah. me. And then the, um, the other thing is some banks want your guarantor, they want their financials, they want their, they want to make sure the guarantor can service the loan. They really make it hard to use a guarantor there are lenders that are like hey we're just using equity in the property i need the guarantors um id um, i have a discussion with them explaining guarantor and then that's um rates notice and a home loan statement don't make it too hard for them if you're asking someone to help you you don't want to then put them through the ringer so talk to me about guarantors for a second just really quickly like elevator version um and then i also want to talk about what is equity how you use it how it helps you buy more properties faster. Um, so guarantors quickly, um, you've just sort of gone in that it sounds like pretty much any man and his dog can within the family unit can lend you with one bank or another or that yeah. now. But what's it mean for say I'm earning 150,000 bucks a year, but I don't have the deposit ready to go, but I don't want to miss out on Brisbane going up by another 18% in the next two years, according to BIS economics, mum and dad, Arnie and, Mum and dad, let's just say, have a great property. I don't want to borrow the money from them, but I want to be guarantor. Yeah. And then I want to get myself off the guarantor, my parents off the guarantor as soon as possible, like I talked about in the previous podcast with Ben, and I want to pay them back as, you know, how does that whole thing work? Oh, good. Okay. How do you even ask your parents for that sort of thing? This is, this is gold, all right? So using a guarantor, the magic number is that 20%, yeah? So if you've got a um, parent... This is just roughly, but if you've got a parent with a million dollar property, they keep 20% equity in their own home. 
Yes, they need to own 20%. They can only borrow up to 80. Borrow up to 80. So if their home loan's 40, 400, they've got 400 equity there. They can release to someone to help them buy a property. Yeah. It means that if you use your parents' property as a guarantee, you know, if you use the, it means you can borrow the full amount plus costs. So you can borrow, if you're buying, using your parents as a guarantor for 800, you can buy the full amount plus the costs, no deposit required. I've got one at the moment, Chris, who's just been approved yesterday to buy his first property using his parent as a guarantor. He's borrowed full amount plus costs, and he's um, we also helped him with his credit score. He had a um, default that was um, hurting him that's now, we got that sorted. I accidentally missed the car repayment or a Yeah, card. just it was unaware. Done, it was young. It wasn't until I mentioned to him, he goes, oh man, I'd forgotten about that. It's okay, we'll get that sorted. Came back to me, we then um, got him, he's approved doing that. Now, guarantor, some banks want your guarantor. They want a lot of information. They want to know they're working. They don't want your guarantor on a pension. They want your guarantor to be able to afford the property you're buying. It's really um, quite tricky. And the, the risk of guarantor is you default on your loan. Both loans are tied together. Yeah. They will go to the guarantor and try and sort I think, stuff out. I think out. a default would be early stage, but if it, if it really went pear-shaped, then you were... Um, you know, you're in some trouble and it would go back the to the guarantor. The properties are connected, right? And but, that, that's why not everyone, my parents, that would never have been an option for me because my parents didn't understand it property well enough. And, you know, they're also like, go and sort it out on your own if this is what you want to do, where there's, and when it's not just a first timer or like a single guy or a single girl that use their parents as guarantor. Like I work with heaps of people that are like, we're family, um, you know, we've got a couple of young kids, we've got great incomes, but we just cannot save this deposit and we just need to get in. Like it's yeah. not your traditional 20 year old living in the parents' basement at home, sort of trying to get a guarantor going on. And I guess the other thing is that um, by going to a guarantor, some banks won't let you buy an investment property as guarantor, some banks will. So that's a really good case where you need to reach out to a broker and be like, hey, which bank's gonna help me the best? What's gonna make it easy for my guarantor? How can we be informative? I've got a few videos I can forward out. Um, information packs, you can sit down with a guarantor, show them the video, say, hey, look, what do you think? The good thing is, too, I've got one guy who went guarantor for his daughter. Once she had 20% in equity, it's 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 a valuation and a form to get that guarantor removed. And you want to get the guarantor off as, as, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, sometimes it takes five. I've seen it take clients five years for the yeah. 20% or 10%. I've seen one that's one year. Yeah, I've seen it like literally... I had one the other day, eight months. He's oh. like, do I have to do this? And I'm like, do I take them off? I'm like, talk to your account. And obviously I can't comment or your broker. He's like, well, what if I want to take them off this one and use them for my next investment again the same way? And I'm like... Some banks can do that. There's lots of things. So it's like, these are the conversations people can have with you around options. And you get the interest rate. If you've got a 5% deposit, you're going to have a hard interest rate. It might be tricky. The guarantor scheme or the... First time by guarantee scheme allows you a better interest rate as well as no LMI. Guarantor gives you a great interest rate too because you don't want to buy that first property, borrow the full amount plus cost and be on a terrible rate. They'll look after you. To remove guarantor is easy and that guy that went guarantor for his daughter, she removed herself off. He went for his next daughter. So he can just like pass it on. There's no... Um, really cool thing to be able to help your kids into the market without you my... taking 200 grand out of your own bank account to pay for it for them. The guy, the guy um, you sent through to me, Jonathan, last night, he's like, hey, parents could send me some money. I was like, well, we have a chat to them. You could do that. But if they weren't guarantor, he said they've got a few investment properties. Maybe they just need to provide one property's equity, not their whole property. And it's also called a limited guarantee now, where you're not saying I'm using my property as security. You're saying I'm using this much equity of my property. Oh, that's cool. So, so use fire warring eight firewalling 80%, 90% of your property. Yeah. So only 10%, 20% of your property is exposed to risk as yeah. a guarantor as well. Which is so good. I mean, before my time, apparently it was, you're putting the whole property on the yeah. line, whereas now it's a limited guarantee. I'm releasing- That's brand new. 200 grand equity to Ben to um, buy property. So talk to me about equity a little bit, like similar to the offset accounts, what is equity, does it work? And- we'll talk about how we both used it as well okay so equity is more prob more an issue if you're buying your first home you know you're gonna have a period there where you're 
you don't have 20%. For a lot of people saving 20% deposit. I didn't have a 20% deposit till my 10th investment property personally. Mm. It took ages. It's like trying to trying to save 20% is like trying to chase after a bus that's driving away from you because 20% of a property that keeps going up, it, you know, you're running after something you're never going to catch. So by New Zealand doesn't have LMI, doesn't have an option of LMI. Whereas Australia, some people say, oh, I don't like LMI. Option B is you don't buy and you wait and then it's actually a good tool to help. It's a cost and it's a bit, it's a, I think it's a bit backwards, but it's helpful how it's insurance for the bank that you pay. You know, like, can I, this is why it's helpful, right? Like, let's just look at um, Brisbane in the last 12 months or Adelaide, Sydney, Perth. They've all done 10% growth, right? According to Core Logic. If you had a 10% deposit a year ago, and you could borrow eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So you had eighty thousand bucks plus your closing costs of twenty grand. So you had a hundred grand in the bank, and you're like, some bank manager or broker was like, you should save a larger deposit. Or actually, it never comes from those guys. It's always from a family member, colleague, or friend that's got your best interest at heart, saying you shouldn't be paying LMI. Yeah. Because they might have bought when I started buying, and there was no LMI. Yeah. And you could borrow. 97 and a half percent after the gfc no oh, lmi wow. no stamp duty wow like at different stages of the cycle like where people's education's at is generally where they come into the market and so they're like lmi is the devil it's the worst thing in the world and i'm like well on an 800k property that's gone up by 10 percent, it's gone up by eighty thousand dollars in the last 12 months in perth adelaide or brisbane it would have gone up by one hundred and sixty thousand dollars um mm. In that 12 months, you've saved $30,000. So your deposit's gone from like 100K to 130K. But now you're trying to buy a property that's $180,000 to $160,000 more expensive. And so the gap's gone out. Yeah. When the market's running, which is the time when you want to buy. So a running market is anywhere from 5% through to 20% gains a year. The average person, unless you're on 500 grand a year after tax, is never going to be able to catch the gain in the market through savings. And so this is a way to bridge that gap, really. It's just getting people in sooner. It's a, it's a shitty cost of business that doesn't benefit you as a consumer at all. And I reckon it's just some bank managers like, do you reckon people will pay this? Because if there's no real insurance for the bank on this money, as far as I'm concerned either, yeah. um, it's just like a cash grab. Another rant here, another like no, conspiracy for good, me. Good rant, good rant. You could probably say no, that's not true. Like it does give the bank some protection for some. No, I'm always, I'm always. Um, you imagine the bank wants you have twenty percent skin in the game. If you've only got five, they've got to go ninety five. I can see the, the the chance of you defaulting is much higher, right? You could do a runner. If it probably goes down to like, how I'm out, I've only got five percent skin in the game. Twenty percent is the number where banks just relax. Yeah, I feel good about this. Hey, he's got twenty percent, and he's not. He, he's in. If you um to, to do your question there, if, if you've got a property, eight hundred, you put in ten percent deposit, it's gone up. So now you've got say twenty percent equity, plus you've got cash to buy your next property, but it's not quite twenty. Yeah, you can use the equity in your property to buy another property. Yeah, even if you don't have the twenty percent for the new one, there's just the LMI. So. The way that works is I had cool. I had a discussion with um, CBA yesterday. I really got um, BDM there, but I've got a guy. He's got a property with really good equity. Not really good, but he's got good equity in his property. He wants to buy an investment, but he doesn't quite have enough for 20. I said to CBA, how do you try and do that? They said, basically, because he can get more cash out to do 20%, but he'll pay LMI in his home, and then he have money for his property, which is... Works out that way, but I feel like I'm doing. <laughs> but it means that he can, the LMI will balance to the right equation, like maybe the right amount here to make you, maybe going 81% on his own home to go 84% on his investment property is the right balance to minimize the LMI. You know, you're speaking at the start how yeah, people don't care that I may just lock in, here's how much LMI you're paying. You know, that's a different thing as well, which we might go into in a future episode because that's pretty complicated stuff for the mm. average person to get. Yeah, um, sure. But LMI topping up is a strategy that smart investors use all the time. So it's like I've already paid LMI on here. Now the LVR is right down here, but I can use that top up to yeah. slide. Yeah. But that's 
that's just like if you own three plus properties, then we'll we'll educate you on that. You know, that's not something you really have to start worrying about most of the time, especially in a market like the one that we've been in post COVID, where everything's sort of gone up and most people are sitting on good equity. Anyone that bought three to twenty years ago in Australia is sitting on more equity than they can probably use. Yeah. But explain equity effectively instead of putting your own cash down. Let's say I've got my own home or one investment and I want to buy another one, but I don't have cash or even more importantly, I want to keep my cash in the bank for a rainy day. Yeah. You know, let's say you've got a million dollar property that you owe 600K on. What could you do with that to help them buy another 600 grand second property? Well, if you've got, that means you've got, so you've got 600 grand loan on a million dollar property. The bank needs you to hold 20%. So effectively, you've got 200 grand there of equity you can use. So you've got 400K in total equity, but... It needs, it needs, to, keep its own two, it needs to keep its own 200 because each property needs that magic 20%. Yeah? yeah. So that means you've got the factor in there. 200K there's a, there's a There's a big calculator to figure that out, but effectively, you've got equity there. And if you... So you've got 20%, but what I'm saying is if your property was... If you didn't quite have the 20%, you can still buy that property... There'll just be a little bit of LMI on both. And remember that we spoke at the start, exponential, so 81% and 81% to be able to buy that property might be just a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. And so you can effectively use that 200K, which is the equity, um, and, and it can be put down as a deposit for your next property yep. if your income obviously matches that and you can borrow the money from the bank as well. I guess you get to a point and like you'd be in this position where you've built enough equity that... Um, LMI is not a factor. LVR is not a factor. It's all about the income you generate. Can you go to the next property? Because once you've been investing for a while in the right market, your property's gone up. You've got ample equity. The thing that holds you back is that income, income. because, like I said, they shade the rental income yeah. and they turn up the, they put a safety buffer on each interest rate. Yeah. So let's say that someone's sitting here and they're like, I really like the idea of two properties with two granny flats, the financial freedom or three houses. Let's say this person's combined income as a household's 200K per year. Yeah. They don't own any property at the moment, but they've got 200 grand in the bank or a guarantor and they want to go buy their first 600K property. 200K income, 200 grand in the bank, um, 600K first property. You're pretty much rolling out a red carpet. Yeah, don't, you know, like that would be a discussion where we say, hey, look, We'll get the pre-approval organised, but feel free to start looking like you, it's not close there. It's going to be... Um, so they've got their 600k first property and they're like me and you. They're like more aggressive. They want to go out and accumulate those properties in a period of like two to five years and then just coast and pay off the debt slowly over time. Um, 600k property, 500 grand debt, 600 bucks a week in rent, 200k income. Like I know I'm you know yes yeah, making you to be a calculator and but not but but let, let's keep it simple being a few it's as simple as this yeah you got to keep the lvr to 80 percent if you can whether you buy that first house you build the granny flat you build that equity in that property mm -hmm. like it might value it's as simple as your income plus your rental income yeah is, is how much cash you have what are your like what are your what are your outgoings i've got the um my investment property home loan I've got a credit card or a personal loan that a good broker will tell you. They won't say no. They'll say, hey, if you reduce that credit card to $1,000, we're a yes. You know, I have people where I say, you don't need to drop your credit card, but if you ever get in a position, I'm going to tell the bank you're happy to close it if required. Yeah, yeah. which people most of the time are. I, my first property in Australia, I, dropped, I had to drop my credit card from six to, six to two grand, I think. So in that situation of the 200K income, that one 600k property most likely the second 600k property based on today's things is going to be pretty easy as well especially if they've got that um they've got the 200k deposit they've already got the 20 percent for that oh, more one. than 20 percent on their 600 yeah it's then getting to the third property is where it starts to get a little bit more technical right it's like cool i've got my two 600k properties i've run out of cash deposit so i'm gonna to have to use equity next time and it's also getting to the point where it's like, cool, third third property is a little bit of a jump and it just means that, you know, you're looking at all of the lenders and having more strategic conversations. But it, it I, I mean, I bought my first six properties earning 80K per year personally. 
Yeah. So it's like, I'm not saying the lending environment's the same as it was then, but if you're prepared to like have periods where you don't do anything for three years and then a period of like, Hey, I can do stuff this year and do it. And then I can't do anything for two years. And then, Hey, the next three years look really good. Yeah. It's just working with the broker strategically to get from where you are to where you want to be. And it might be a five to 15 year journey to do that. It might not all happen in six months or for some, it might like you at the moment, buying two properties, it's going to happen very quickly in a three month period. And then you'll just settle back in for the next five years. And I think that making those steps and making the decisions, like you see a lot of people, I feel like in my job, I see a lot of people, like a lot of different situations. Yeah. And I never judge it. You know, it's just, that's what, you know, you never know what life's had there. You can get person that's 80k a year, teacher, bought their first investment property young, when they're ready, jump to the next one. I've got a lady, um, I won't say her name, she's a teacher. I think she's got like six properties now on 80k a year. She's just made every few years, just gone and got another one. And then, you know, we joke and say, man, you're building the empire. You know, soon every second house in Queensland is going to have your name on it. But <laughs> um, it's just like anything, it's chipping away and just being like, you know what I mean? Trying to jump that, trying to buy 10 properties in one go is a mission. And you do see those people trying to say that, but in general... They never do it. No, they never do it. No. Just try to... Yeah, learn I how to... I was one of those le- people, by the yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> like most young idiot, 20-year-old yeah. boys. You know, I've got two other questions quickly. Um, I think where you're getting to there is the same as me, though, and definitely our business is a lion. Slow and steady. Like, it is a marathon investing. Um, if you want financial freedom through property, 15 years is a good time frame. If you're balling out, then maybe you can do it in 10 years if you've got a really big inheritance or something like that. But it really does come down to strategy, the right plan, the right markets at the right time and chipping away at paying off debt, chipping away at buying properties, chipping away at learning things like these things that we're learning. You've been investing since you were 19, you said you're turning 43 soon. Yeah, Saturday. Um, Saturday. Mm. You know, it's so cool. Like, it's just, but it's a process. Like, mm. little things picked up along the way. I've been investing now for 15 years. I've been reading about it for 17 years. I've been doing it every day for nine. Um, I'm learning heaps off this podcast, which is why I want to ask you this next question. Credit scores, which you yeah. brought up before. How do you get yourself in a, what's, what's bad for credit scores and how do you reverse it? And then what's, what keeps you in the green with credit scores as well? Ah, good question. So people haven't, I have people that say I got a credit card because I wanted to get my credit score. I wanted to build a credit That's score. That's such an American thing, isn't it? Is. I see that on all the Renault shows. All they care is don't have a bad credit score. You know, like you can have, I've got plenty of clients that are like, they're getting their home and it's their first ever liability that you know it's the first ever debt not even the liability but i mean they, they've got no credit score perfect you know like that's fine it's if you make a default it's going to get caught if you have missed repayments but a good broker will help you out the guy I spoke about chris had a default long time ago forgot about it 17 grand that default was and he's like man i just you know it's about coming up with a plan we helped him out i had one guy he had five defaults yeah mm-hmm he rang up all of his people and discussed it with them and got four removed just wow. by discussing with his... And this could be like, I didn't pay my electricity bill. I didn't pay a wow. car repayment. You'd see it all. I didn't, I, I didn't, I moved addresses and I didn't even know the energy bill was and, outstanding. And you don't even, uh, and it can hinder you so much. So just, if you see you got a bad credit score, don't make it stop you. Find a way to get it organized. I had one guy went to his house and he's like, hey, Clay, before you run a credit score, I've just got to have a couple of beers. So why is that? He goes, yeah, it hasn't been good. He's like, <laughs> oh, well, he goes, I haven't bought a property for 15 years because I'm that stressed about my credit score. Wow. So he banged two beers and he said, I'm going to have to go outside while you run this. So he went outside. He had a perfect credit score. But he thought because he... Because he had something. a default from a long, long, long time ago. It eventually clears. Yeah. He had been stressing about it. He goes, oh, Clay, this is better than getting a home loan. Oh. I've, been, I've got my partner here on the couch with me want to buy a home. I've been delaying this for five years because I'm stressed about that moment. Came up with like a thousand credit scores. You know, he's he's laughing. I said, mate, your credit score's almost too good. I have to write notes around why it's so good, you know? Why is this guy so squeaky clean? (laughs) 
He's not this clean. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. No, that's crazy, bro. That's um, it's really cool to hear that that you can help with people and those musicians. Like, there's a guy I used to work with for a long time, um, like absolute legend. He worked inside the business. He works with one of our referral partners now, and he um he had a mark against his name for something that happened years ago, and I just feel like talking to someone like you, it's either hey man, this isn't great, but this is what we can do together. Or, hey, this isn't bad at all. Like, let's just call them, work out a plan and get it removed. Or, hey, it's not even a bigger deal at all. But instead, the market around him, like, again, not everywhere. Like, there's suburbs in Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Sydney that have done 100% in the last 10 years. And then there's suburbs near them that have done 2 to 5% over the same time. So, it's not like everywhere in Brisbane's cranked. It's these suburbs have and if you look at 450 500 of them a year then you'll find needles in the haystack if you know where to look yeah and and he's like you know he thinks he's got a bad credit score and now he's missed hundreds of k of oh, gains and it's like dude that guy had bought 15 years ago on sunshine coast you know like it's almost like he's relieved but i'd almost be a bit annoyed well he would like have bought I, a 400 k home that's now worth two mil oh yeah i mean devastating and it's just education and it can be as simple as hey you've got a default your bank won't help you it might be a power bill that you had in melbourne got guy had a power bill in melbourne moved to queensland yeah this power bill probably got put into his letterbox with the default letter that he never received it wasn't until i said oh mate you're a default who with well energy company six years ago i didn't even know mate ring them up he's like i made i moved house they paid the 300 dollars and it was all good but that that would stop him. A lot of banks that go, hey, mate, you've got a default, can't help you. Wow. Whereas a broker can say, hey, mate, just ring them up, get it sorted. Love that. And um, the other one that got is if you ever have someone going through a separation, that's probably the instance where people can get the worst credit scores. Yeah, if you're separating from your partner, you're both like, mate, I'm not paying it. Yeah. I've got one bank that will consider that a life event. Like if you've got, if you're squeaky clean for your life and then you have one event, a separation, it goes, Kiwi term, pear-shaped. It means that You've got defaults, it's really gone crazy. The bank can see that. Mate, this guy was great. He's been through a separation. Let's move forward. You know, he's sorted now. Let's get him a property. That was a life event. And if you've got one life That's event, right. that shouldn't hold you back. I could see that. Like of in most relationships, one partner, whether it's the man or the woman, pays the bills. Like you go through a hmm. event like that. It might not even be, I'm not paying it. It's more just, I just didn't even know that was coming in. And it yeah, was yeah. in my name. Like the electricity bill might be in my name, even though the house is in Lisa's name. Yeah, like, you might not even, there might even be a phone bill that your partner paid for you that didn't even know was under your name. You know, like. Fully. Yeah, yeah. It's, it can be easy mistakes that can stop you. You know, so when I was just getting started personally, um, buying my investments, I I had a partner, but she wasn't in a position to help. And so I bought my first two on my own. And then by the third one, we bought together. Um you know, what are the pros and cons of buying on your own versus buying with someone else in terms of borrowing capacity and accessibility to lenders? And then my other question, which I'll just chuck in as well for my own personal interest is, what are your thoughts on working with like top tier lenders versus second and third tier in terms of the pros and cons and risks as well? Ah, um, but yeah, firstly, buying with your partner versus buying on your own. And I'm not saying maybe partner has to be like, wife husband girlfriend boyfriend whatever it could be hey are you buying with your best mate or you're buying with your sister or you're buying with your brother whatever i got some gold here so property share with cba if i buy with if you buy with four people so if four people buy a property for a million dollars that debt is on each individual credit score as a million dollars yeah so if you go to do something the bank will see that you have a million dollar loan. And so do you. And so do you. Yeah. So that means that it's really going to restrict you moving forward. So even though from your perspective, you owe one quarter of a mil. The so bank sees it, it as you owe, the, you owe, you're accountable for the whole lot. And give them the kicker with the rent return as well. Like you think that you're getting the yeah. whole rent. but You're only getting, a, like... you get a quarter of the rent, but all of the debt. So you're so in your next really step, your next step, the bank's gonna go, how much rent you get? Oh, one fourth of that property, but I have the full debt on that amount. Yep. Um, which is deadly for continuing to move forward on your own. Yeah. Which is why I sold my first two properties because they were with mates. I wanted to keep buying, 
but I didn't realize this at the time. And now I obviously do that. I was liable for the whole debt, got a third or half of the rent and it just stopped me in my tracks moving forward with my wife on my own properties. CBA have a pop policy called property share. Stop it. Where you can split it. So is this new? Yes, I've never yeah, heard new of it It's been, I, I've only come across it recently. So here's this easy credit thing in the cycle I was talking about again. How mm. can we get people borrowing more money? So, so if I've, I've got right now two brothers. Yeah. Um, they want to, oh, one brother was putting in, what happened there? So you got two couples wanting to buy a property. You can property share it. You can only split it into two, but it means that if you and your partner and me and my partner bought a property together, you can property share it with CBA and it means that you have 500 grand debt against your name. I've got 500 grand against my name, which is going to help us moving forward. And you're getting and 50% of the income each from the base. Yeah, so it means, it means you can use that step as way better. You imagine if you've got a 500 grand debt going to your next step, so much better having a million. If that's, that's phenomenal. I didn't even know about it. Did you, did you say there was something else you wanted to... Yeah, so if you're buying with your partner... Um, another policy that's pretty good is ANZ have a policy where if I'm buying with my partner, buying a, so I'm married, but I want to buy a property just in my name, most banks will need to consider my wife's as earning no income. So it's me and a wife and two kids, and I want to buy the property. So I have to take in all the expenses of that. ANZ have a policy where, and a few others where, if your wife's working, just let them know they're working and therefore you don't need to factor in the wife into your purchase. So she's no longer like a liability. Yeah, maybe a pay slip or something just to show, hey, wife is working, therefore she doesn't need to be a factor of my equation. The other one that's pretty good is if oh, a few banks, if you've got, if you're separated, you've got four kids, those four kids can really um, hinder your buying power, you know, especially if you've got 50% gear. Some banks have a policy where hey, you've got 50% of four kids, let's call that two kids. Mm. Which means that if you've been shot down by your bank, your buying power is low, and you've got 50% custody of four, means you only really have two, therefore let's move forward. Unfortunately, if you've got three, they count that as two, you can't have one and a half. I think, <laughs> I think the biggest thing that I'm picking up here is you're only as good as the person you're working with knowledge is, mm. and it's a complicated space you're in. 30 lenders, each with different policies for different people, which is why most brokers get to the point where they've like got four lenders, four that lenders which I get. And they've, they've got a couple of top tiers, a couple of secondaries that cover like 80% of the gamut. And then there's very, very specialist lenders and brokers that work with people with prickly situations, you know what I mean? And I think... It's important to note that like you having this skill set when someone comes in to talk to you is exponentially more valuable to me than just the one bank manager that can sell you, you know, the Volvo from the front door and, you know, it's what colour does it come in? Black, black, and black. But they only know, that's not against them. They only know that, they only know and can only offer that. That's it. Yeah. And that's, that's what I think broking so important. But my second little geek out question personally is like, there's always this online debate on all the forums of only be with top tier lenders and then there's secondary, then there's third and there's fourth and fifth from that. I've, I've been down to like level three, level four, had a great experience. It was one of the simplest banks I've ever worked with. Yeah. Um, I don't know what their balance sheet looked like if we were going through a financial crisis, but got any thoughts on, we're not talking about experience or service or even policy, more just like thoughts on first versus second tier like what would you go for if you could choose with your own money do you go with cba or do you go with someone like i, pr I pr probably prefer to sit with the major lenders but I, I you know if you're a client doesn't want to go to the major lenders i totally understand then i want to go path of least resistance you know if you say hey claire you know i hate this bank cool let's not go to that bank we've got plenty of options the rates at the moment they're all very competitive you know there's they're all very similar there's not a lot of variance because it's been sitting for a little while and it's sort of like the tide sort of settled a little bit. Mm. When things start moving again, there can be some big variances, but... Why would you go to a third or fourth tier lender? Generally, it's because the majors are saying no, right? Like, that's when I've gone there before because they're like, I'm not going to give you this money at 5%, but maybe Liberty. I'm just pulling a name out of the air and I'm not saying they're... I don't no. know where they sit, but they're going to give me the same 
they're going to give me the money that I couldn't borrow with CBA for 7% instead of 5 So they're taking the loan for the extra risk, but they're earning more from it as well. Yeah. So if you've got like a lender like, generally if you're going to seek it, there has to be a reason, you know, why we're going there. Um, one lender uses, um, one lender I use sometimes, they, if you receive, um, if you pay private education, say you've got a bill of 2000 a month, private education, do you want to refi? Doesn't work. Some lenders consider private education as not a mandatory expense. Like if if your whole world got, if the whole world went pear-shaped. the kids in public You school. can always go to public school. Like it's not, we don't need to make that a, um, it's an expense, but we can consider it differently because it is, you know, it's not like food where you, you can avoid it. Generally, like my experience has been, if I can't borrow money with a major and I really want to buy, then I might consider a secondary third lender um, because they might lend me a little bit more money and take on a little bit more risk for a higher interest rate. But not even a little bit, like a lot. Yeah, a lot more sometimes. Like you had, you had 40 year loan term, you had, um, you know, if you're in a position where you want to buy another investment property, you're not too risky. Like you might have good equity in your home, you've got a few investments, you want to buy another one. It's not as risky as someone buying their first home with that lender. Not saying it is risky, but it means, hey, I just want to buy another one. Cool. Um, all your debts, how much do they equal per month? Cool. We don't need to act a safety buffer on that. We've got a 1% buy-in buffer and we've got a 40-year loan term. How can you do it? And the other thing is they factor in um, all income. Like they don't, they might not shade bonus or commission or overtime. They might just say, hey, how much have you earned? Tick. Yeah. Love that. See, that's a big one. Like a lot of those top tiers want to see like base salaries or they'll count. Hmm. And then it's like, well, hey, I've got heaps of clients that are earning 100 or 200 grand a year base with upside of 100 to a million dollars a year. And it's like they won't be taken into account or... Um, or they were shaded, they were, they were shaded by 80% or they'll... Um, nurses, some banks consider nurses do a lot of overtime. Or if actually if you're a um, public service, they'll take 100% of your overtime. Yeah. Wow. I, they, I heard of someone the other day, a um, guy driving a rubbish truck public service you know does a lot of overtime mm -hmm. he needs his job as reliant therefore he can use um we can use 100 percent. it's incredible man like i'm mm. so grateful to just learn like as a property <laughs> geek like <laughs> to learn more about this stuff from you today you can see why i don't invite me to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like, nah man i've froth on it as you know like this is my absolute passion and knowledge is power and the cool thing about being a buyer's agent right is you could spend the next 15 years learning what I've learned or you could just plug into what I've learned and get the benefit. And, you know, you know a lot about property, but you're working with me. I could go to a bank. I could go to an average broker, but working with someone who's an investor, who's obsessed as well, is just a very powerful thing. Like I get plugged into 20 lenders from you and, you know, four to 10 of them in a seriously specific way. Yeah. And then when the values align as well, it just makes the whole experience easier. But I'm so grateful, man. Like there's so many more finance related questions that I want to ask. Okay. So we're definitely going to, if it's okay, get you yeah. back on the potty. Yeah. Maybe once a quarter, maybe more than that if you want to carve out some time. But yeah. I, there's so many questions around grants that are coming up that I want to ask. There's so many other questions I have about monetary policy about expenses about getting yourself looking good for the bank yeah. about buffers about safety about how many properties people can own it's all just gonna have to wait though because yeah, this is so already much. like there's so much yeah but yeah. i'm so grateful man like you're an encyclopedia in that space and thanks for going through all that deep work that you've done yeah. so that other people can benefit and sharing this information for free. I'm so grateful. Um, so before we finish things up, um, obviously you're with Aussie. If anybody wants to reach out to you to get some ideas on are they paying too much, um, they want to refinance, they want to get a better rate, or they're thinking about buying an investment or their own home in the next year, how can they get in contact with you if they want some help? I'd say the best way is probably by email. And I know it's not... Um even just flicking me a message on email, I will get back to you because mm -hmm. I live my life on my phone and um, I will call you back, but it's always busy. And email's there. I'm accountable because it says there, hey, can you give me a call? I'll call you. And then, um, yeah, so C-L-A-Y. Clay. Clay. Dot Bremer, B-R-E-M-E-R at Aussie.com.au. Awesome. And please no spam, guys. Like, 
Uh, <laughs> it gets enough yeah. emails. I'll block you. <laughs> yeah, just just love. Like this mm. channel is all about that. But if you're listening this far into this conversation, you already get that. But yeah, yeah we're just we're trying. We're just normal people with small portfolios trying to do the right thing by people from the lessons we've learned. Like, yeah, um, we're still people. <laughs> we get some hate, but I'm just like, <laughs> I'll, I'll be I'm trying to do that. the right thing here. I don't know yeah. what. Like, I don't know how I could be. I could help more. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm just getting blown up. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something about a helpful place people can get credit score tips or something. Yeah, so you want we, to check your credit score. I'll put a link in the chat below. Yeah, I always wanted to say that. And this is my first nice. podcast. I'll put a chat a link in the chat. You're, below. You, oh, okay, you put a link <laughs> in the chat below. But it's Please just send gonna, it to me after. You can click on it and you can look up your credit score. Cool. It's free. You know, it's worth having a check. You know, you might not know that you had a power bill you didn't pay in Melbourne five years ago. It could hold hold you up doing things in the future. Okay. Get it sorted. If it is a bit glitchy, just Get it sorted. Cool. Last question is how often should people look at their rates? Like let's say for me, this conversation's made me go, shit, I've been really slack in the last two years. Mm. I know I'm paying more than some of those rates you mentioned earlier in the podcast. Like do you think reaching out to your broker once a year and just sending him a text message for a quick 10-minute chat and going, hey, mate, do you think there's anything better we can do is enough? Yep, I reckon. And then, you, I reckon even just just keep an eye on it. Um, be... I'd say once a year, just check on it. Your broker, a good broker will be calling you to say, hey, look, you know, just want to do a rate review, check you're okay. Yeah. Um, remember, it only takes your broker, I'm going to say three minutes to request a discount on the bank portal. So pricing with CBA, Westpac, NAB, Bank West, anything like that, you just jump on the portal, type it. If you're already a customer with some banks, it's a button to click, say he would like a rate review, click. Wow. You know that. You don't even have to type anything. Rate review, click. But that can be only on loans that you've written for yeah. that client, right? But, so but I can to... still request a discount on loans that are existing. Yeah, you can. There's ways around that too. Cool. And it can be a case of, I've had people lately where they say, hey, what's the best rate? Say they've got, say they're on 6.3. It's not too bad. You could probably do a bit better. I'll be honest with you, you're banking with Macquarie. That's a good rate. I'd just ask them for a discount. You know? cool. And I call them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Man, I'm so grateful for today. I've learned so much. Um, oh, you're, you're such a legend, bro. I can't wait to um, have like more fun conversations too. Like obviously yeah. the front end of this podcast <laughs> is just having a laugh, but we've both got some war stories and we haven't even scraped the surface yet. So yeah, yeah I'm so grateful, man. No, and thanks, um, thanks for sharing your no, time with everyone. So much. Um, I know I've said this a few times, but Clay's the real deal if you need some support. So don't be afraid to send him an email if you're looking to refinance or get some um, money for a property you're thinking to buy with or without using us. It's irrelevant, like yep. plays his own thing. Yeah. Appreciate it, mate. Have a good uh, week. Cool. Thanks, man. See you, bye. If you're thinking about buying an investment property in the next three to six months, then the team and I at Pump John Property would love to offer you a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. To book the session, all you have to do is go to www.pumpedonproperty.com and click that free strategy session button. Now in the session, we'll talk about exactly where you are right now, we'd like to be longer term and educate you deeply on the Australian property market. You can then take that information and go and absolutely smash it on your own or potentially become one of the small number of clients that we work with each month. Either way, we look forward to continuing to help you build your property portfolio with confidence on your journey to financial freedom. Uh, cheers, Ben. Thanks for um, getting me in here. It's been um, really exciting. Like, uncomfortably lo lo good. Uncomfortably <laughs> good. Like I said, over a thousand videos, first video, so it's been pretty fun. Anxiety um, and excitement feel close. Oh yeah, it's, yeah, it's been fun. Like long time listener, first time speaker. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what's it? Maybe we used to do that on radio. Eh? It's like, Let's say like long time listener, first time speaker. Yeah, yeah, I love that. First time caller. First yeah. time caller. Yeah. Um,